Well, well, welcome everyone. I'm not sure if you hear the music in the background, trying to, you know, <laughs> get ready for Friday for the weekend. Um, thank you so much for being here, you know, celebrating International Women's Day with us. My name is Carolina Castro. I'm a communications and community strategist, and I'm also Women Tech Makers Ambassador on the East Coast, specifically New Jersey but I also roll with the GDG Cloud Group in New York City. Um, super excited to be here. Again, thank you for being here to celebrate International Women's Day week and month. So this year was clearly like super challenging for a lot of us. Um, and so, you know, for many reasons, we've noticed our GDG and WTM communities come together strong. So you're seeing this come together through this huge partnership, collaboration to put together this amazing program for you this weekend. So. Thank you for being here, right? The theme of our event of our evening today is having the courage to create. So there's so many things that you could say, it's such a profound thing to sort of rally around, right? Because we, we have shown up, right, as so much this past year. We have had the courage to show up and we've had the courage to create. So as we go through the evening, just you know, think about what do you have the courage to create in your life, whatever that may be. And so feel free to share that, right? Feel free to share that in the chat, um, in, in the breakout rooms later today. And yeah, just let us know how you're feeling or just feel free to write it down on the post-it. So, so excited to dive in and obviously some really quick like housekeeping items. Um, so be respectful to each other. You know, I, I'm not sure we need to say more there. Be respectful to each other in the chats. We're also having some breakout sessions. So, so yeah, and also be mindful that we're recording everything on Zoom. Um, use the Q&A uh, setting to ask any questions throughout the event. Just interact with each other. Feel free to share that all um, in the chat and being mindful that we are recording today's event. Um, yeah, so feel free to also interact with us on social, you know, um, hashtag, you know, courage to create women tech makers share some gems that you picked up this weekend, anything that sort of like, you know, made you sort of continue thinking about what you've had the courage to create this year and what you have the courage to create going forward. Super excited to read what you all share there. Another disclaimer, we are recording. <laughs> so courage to create is such a profound thing, right? To have the courage to create really innovative like solutions in your office, for your organization, or the courage to create justice and equality, which has been like a very heavy theme for most of us this year. So things to just sort of keep in mind as we go through. Whoops. <laughs> awesome. So we have a pretty <laughs> amazing program this evening. Um, our next, our first talk and our next talk is going to be uh, on things you, they don't teach engineers at school by Ella Crespa, who's an engineering manager and tech lead at Google. And then we'll have a breakout session so we could connect and interact and engage. And then our second um, event, our second talk will be a workshop on confident communication skills and how to be heard in the virtual world by Leo Von Vesuto, who's a communications coach and a founder at Present Voices. And then we'll have another, you know, a, sm a smaller breakout session again. So we come together, just kind of share any reflections and connect. And then we'll be closing the event with a, a panel on collaborative leadership and leading with your whole selves. Super excited for that. Um, and we'll be, like I said, that, that'll be our third event, but we'll be closing out with, um, with a raffle and prizes. Super excited for that. These are amazing speakers tonight. You get to interact with them later today. Thank you to our amazing GDG organizers. None of this would have been possible without everything that you do in your communities, right? To make tech more inclusive and equitable. Shout out to all of you who have put in a lot of energy and effort to rallying our speakers, rallying our team. Thank you know, thankful to be a part of that as well. Thank you to our sponsors. I'm going to pass it over to Linda, who's going to give a little bit more of a, a rundown on who they are and what they've uh, have contributed towards this event. So we uh, can everybody hear me? So if you are with us until the end, uh, we will uh, pass along uh, a link for a form for you to fill out to be included in our raffle. Uh, we will offer to all our attendees uh, uh, 
Coursera Free Lifetime, lifetime uh, License uh, from uh, Atria Institute Technology. Uh, also for all attendees, we will give a 30 days full access to whole library of O'Reilly. We will raffle five e-books from O'Reilly. Uh, also, we have uh, from Practicum by Index six full scholarships to boot camps to choose from uh, two to data analyst, two to data scientist, and two to web developer. Uh, Pat, uh, also we have four uh, ROI uh, on demand Google Cloud certification training for associate or uh, professional uh, cloud engineering. And I will uh, pass it over to the others to present the sponsors. Uh, Liz, would you like to go next? Sure, sure. Um, we've got uh, four Amazon gift certificates from Wellframe. They are a uh, company in the seaport area in Boston, um, automating healthcare at home, and they are hiring. So we'll come back to that a little bit uh, later when we pick people to be the winners of the raffle, but you got to stay, you got to stay to the end. <laughs> uh, so Edna, did you want to? Yes, thank you, Liz. So we have Gaspacho offering a $50 Amazon gift card and that will be raffled off at the end. Need to be here to win it. And Anna? Our last one. Of course, everyone knows Women Take Makers is a Google supported organization. Uh, our speakers are from there, our groups are supported by them, and they provide three Google Nest Hubs for three lucky winners. So have to stick to the end. Yay. Amazing. As you know, it wouldn't be a GDG event without raffles, right? <laughs> Surprising. <Yeah. laughs> So thank you so much, you ladies. I know you've put in a lot of work to get these uh, sponsorships. So thank you again to our sponsors. Keep it coming. We have only one disclaimer for the Nest Hubs. You have to be located in US, Canada, or India only due to shipping and costume uh, issues. So only that. So thank you for understanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So on to our first talk. Do we have Ella Kreska with us? Hi, can you hear me all? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi, let's see. Okay, Hi. So I need to present, right? Yes, I could give I you- I spent whole morning figuring it out. <laughs> thank you for being here, Ella. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, of course. You have such a fascinating background. Um, let's see. You are able to present. Okay, am I presenting? Yes. Yes, you are. All right. Hi, everyone. I wish this was in person. I would make it a little interactive. But I think in this case, I'm going to speak a bunch of time. And then I think I'm gonna not going to fill the whole slot. So we can have a Q&A. Also, I'll try to join uh, some chat room. I try to do it in parallel. But I don't know, maybe I'll reply later. Also, I'm available on email, feel free to ping me. And you may hear a screaming toddler. Sorry. <laughs> she got sick exactly on this day and she's very whiny. <laughs> my, my husband is with her, so don't worry, she's okay. She's just screaming. Um, all right, so let's dive in. Um, so in this talk, I will reflect um, on what engineering school teaches and how engineering job actually works in a place such as Google and what it means to be successful at it. Um, so this is the first time I'm showing this content. So I, I really welcome any feedback. Uh, I literally was editing a slide just a minute ago. Um, so what are the things that surprised me in my career eight years at Google? Uh, and I wish someone told me earlier, eight years ago, I think I would have been more effective and more prepared. So what happened eight years ago? Eight years ago, I graduated from a university with a freshly baked PhD. Uh, this is a photo of me and my dad and my brother right after on the day I defended my thesis through a total brain freeze. It was very tough. Um, 
And I finished my education after I reflected 24 years of schooling of some sort. That seemed like enough. And I decided to leave academia and join Google. Um, I've since worked on some product. You may heard some about some of them. You may be user about uh, some of them. I worked on Google Ads, Google Play, YouTube, AdMob, and uh, actually much more that didn't fit the slide. Uh, I will not talk about these products. I will talk in general my conclusions about what it is that makes an engineer successful at a big company like Google. Um, all right, first, what is successful to me? And this is not an absolute definition. Um, it is like personal and it is for the purpose of this talk. I'm happy to debate this definition, um, but it has to meet three components. Number one, it's when your code or product positively impacts users or other engineers or revenues. Uh, I, I spent eight years doing all kinds of monetization products, so I can look for revenues, but that's maybe just my bias. Um, secondly, your work need to be excellent. To me, you need, I want to be proud of my work, and I um, that is part of happiness and success to me. And the last component, I want to build a reputation that makes other people want to work with me. This means collaborations will be easier. It means all kinds of good things come out of that. All right, so that's kind of roughly success. Um, somehow the first bullet point to me is most important, making impact. But like I said, it's not an absolute definition. Is someone saying something? Okay, I'll just move on. Um, the first thing I want to talk is perfection. So this is counterintuitive. Why wouldn't we want to be perfect? Why wouldn't we want to build perfect product, write perfect code? Uh, in school, we are told perfection is great. Um, the closer to perfection, the better the grade, the more successful you are in school. So you try to get the perfect score, the perfect attendance, the perfect answers. You try to follow the rules. You do all your homework. You hand in work on time. This, the more perfect you are, the better the school, the better the, the result. But this is not like engineer, that's not how engineering career, career works. It's much more complicated at work. So here's a few examples that at first glance, they sound good. And I tell you why I learned to discover that a lot of these are, are not so great. So first you can think, you could say, I implemented all the features in my project, but, you know the saying that 20% of work will bring you 80% of benefits? So I will claim that something like 20 to 50% of that, of that, in that case, when you implemented everything, 20 to 50% was actually time really well spent, features that users are using. And the rest may not be so obvious. Maybe they are good for some other reasons than impact. Maybe you want to build product excellent, excellent product. Uh, maybe you build some features for small slice of customers that are important, or maybe they were not needed. Maybe your time would have been spent building a second project, and you would have two instead of one if you could spend half time building that project. So prioritization matters. Uh, another example of perfect kind of statement is my code is maximally flexible. This is a something actually I have have experience as a manager. Um, for example, all objects have an interface. So if I have an object in the future, I don't need to, it's easy to plug it in. I will just make it implement my interface. What's wrong with exactly that? What I did, I found out how to like, replace your webcam something. That's my webcam, by the way. That's Can someone webcam. mute Hold about the webcam? Oh, uh, Ella, can you unmute yourself? Okay, I'm back. <laughs> there was some screaming. That yes, was not there was. my daughter. Oh, thank you. And no worries. <laughs> um, so where were I? Where was I? Um, 
why would something like that implementing uh, interfaces for everything even if you just have one object implementing an interface would not be ideal because you don't know the future you may think you know the future but you probably don't know the future unless you're the one making the future you're a product manager you probably don't know the future and you're over implementing useless features i think i have like translation for the first one you implemented unnecessary features for the second one you implemented overly complex too long code and the last one uh, example implemented perfect performance so maybe you optimize the hell out of some loop was a time well spent maybe that loop is not on a critical path of of users maybe that loop is, is something that user does not even perceive as valuable optimization so you have to always prioritize and make sure that what you're doing is has impact has good value rather than trying to be perfect um, all right um, <clears throat> so conclusion um on the on perfection you don't want to try to be perfect you want to try to be fast and good enough as long as you don't compromise quality velocity will trump perfection and good mantra that i, I always try to remember don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good um, in practice, this means doing high priority work first, and this sounds very easy, but actually I found in practice it's this hard um, for two reasons. Ella? Yeah? Sorry to interrupt you. Um, if you could just reshare your presentation, because I think it's... Oh, go on. Oh. All right. We'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. What do I do? The sharing button disappeared. I think it's removed now. Look, I think someone raised hand. Does someone want to have a, ask a question? Manuel? Okay, I'll just move on. We'll do questions later. All right, so don't be perfect, be good enough and fast. That's far better combo. And why it is hard to prioritize? Number one, it is often hard to know the priority of your work. To know the priority, you need to know the roadmap, the product really well, maybe the competition. You have to collaborate with your uh, product managers, with uh, sellers. Uh, so it is non-trivial sometimes to know the priority of your work. And secondly, even if you know the priority of your work, your human brain conspire, com conspires against you to pick the easy, comfortable work over a hard, impactful work. So that's why it's hard and you have to get better by, by training that muscle. Um, and last point that I wanted to make is that school teaches lots of rules, like um, encapsulate everything, never, never duplicate code. Who would ever duplicate code, right? Ne not heard of, right? It's always wrong. No, for every rule, there is a case when it needs to be broken and a senior engineer knows when to break the rules for example there is a one case when code duplication is actually desired it's in tests for tests you need test readability you often duplicate a whole bunch of codes to have a nice clearly defined tests when preconditions are set up and conditions are checked cool as uh, someone's raising the hand am i supposed to do something no, you're fine, um, Ella. Right. We'll look at questions towards the end. All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, so that uh, that concludes my first point. I think I have like five of these like advices. Number two, uh, right? Building products, it's not the same as coding. So, what I thought this is the picture of what I thought life will look like after I joined Google. That was my assumption. I will spend 100% of time coding. Maybe I take a lunch break. Maybe I check some emails, but I will mainly code. Okay, this is really, really wrong. So my first surprise was testing. So first of all, testing takes a lot of time. Far, you, you will never implement properly especially if it's a mature product. If it's a startup and you're just hacking, maybe you won't do it. But if it's a mature product, like we have a Google, um, you need to have a really 
good coverage of tests to avoid regressions. So I found that if you're testing maybe like a small stateless function, that's super easy. But if you're testing typical code, it takes you um, double the amount of coding to, to ask the test. And sometimes you will write one line change and you spend all day testing it just because you have to mock everything in a compli complicated distributed systems. So testing can be huge, huge tasks. And I never appreciated that at school, in school. And secondly, the thing that happens in school a lot is you write a project, you, you complete it, you submit it, you get a grade, you get your A, and then you abandon it. No one ever has to maintain it, but at work, you typically will maintain your own code. You will write a new V2 features. And if you did poor job testing, you will suffer from it or someone else who will take over from you. So the next surprise after testing was design. So guess what? Systems that have hundreds of collaborators, like it is at Google, do get complicated. Um, code bases become huge. So changing something in a huge code base with a lot of collaborators test, takes, takes a plan. You have to have a good plan, good design, and review from senior folks. To do the good design, you have to know a lot of technical leads, you have to debate, discuss a lot, you have to get reviews. So meetings start cutting to your time and you spend a bunch, big chunk of time actually designing. And secondly, I realized that unit testing is not the end of work. In fact, that's kind of the beginning. So unit tests miss things all the time. You need to do integration testing to test component to component, and you need to test, probably need a global test to test everything from client customer point of view. And finally, even if you test, the next thing is to, there is no like one launch. There is a lot of A-B testing. You launch something, you unlaunch because it didn't work out, you launch something else, you ramp it up. In a cam, in a, for example, in a product like YouTube, when you have 2 billion users, you don't just launch, just press a button. You launch in a very controlled step-by-step -step, uh, manner, maybe like 0.1% and 1% and more, every time watching health and watching performance metrics. And even if you take all these precautions with testing and launching and safety, you still get outages. So you need monitoring, you need alerting dashboards, and you need to handle escalations. So coding is the core of it, but it, it is smaller core, you can see. And the next surprise after this, at some point you have a few projects under your belt, end to end, you launch them, you're so good at this. You naturally start to advise other people how to build products. And half of your time, at least, will start to go to reviewing other people's work, other people's code, and other people's design. And you're probably uh, some kind of formal or informal technical lead role at this point. What happens next? You, you broaden your horizons even more. So the next surprise, and I think this is kind of the last one, uh, is understanding the product, understanding why we're building what we're building why we made certain choices. To do that, you need to collaborate with product manager, product managers to contribute to product requirements. You need to understand the, your market, your competitors, understand the mocks, the designs. You have to understand compliance. Uh, so work with legal team. And you have to understand product roadmap, where you want to take the product. How do you schedule uh, features? Which one do you build first? And of course, nothing, building is not the end of the story. You have to sell the product, make some money or make some happy users. So you have to work with your sales teams, with the go-to-market team. Uh, you probably need to work with your customers and help them implement your solution. You probably have to analyze data and make improvements to your product, right? So see what this, and this happened to me over, let's say uh, five years. My story continues, I become a manager. Coding become from 100 
to a tiny box and actually disappeared for me when I become manager and no longer code. So that's, that's my point. That building products is not just coding. This is what I taught in school, so naively. Um, there's a really good book that I can recommend, Mythical Man Month. It's from 1975. So this is a 40 or 50 year old book. The language is outdated, but the points are really relevant. So even there in 1975, Frederick Brooks says, in his experience, project code takes one sixth of time. Planning takes one third and testing about half. I think maybe testing is a little less right now, but still a significant part. Mm, so just to sum up, um, as my tip is to keep reinventing your work because you know that you are learning and growing if your job meaningfully, qualitatively changes every few years. So one, one time you find yourself uh, contributing, launching some product. A few years later, you find yourself reviewing other people's launches. That's qualitative change, that's growth. Uh, and that's kind of like a new job. So every few years, you reinvent yourself. And signals to watch out for when you're feeling comfortable and bored. Basically, when you know what to do, it feels so good. You know exactly what steps to take. It's time for a change. All right, so that was... Uh, uh, a conclusion of the second advice, number three, is knowing what to code. So that's something that never even occurred to me in school. I was all about coding algorithms and, uh, you know, your AVL balancing and your red, red, black trees. But actually, why would you ever want to use a red, black tree or AVL code? That is important. Okay, so who... Have you ever thought about how much code is out there? Uh, I pulled some numbers from the internet uh, and I pulled from some uh, famous projects. So you can see projects on the X, X, uh, X axis and on the Y axis, you can see lines of codes in million in, on a log scale. So for example, Windows 10 is 50 million line of code. Google in 2015 had 2 billion line of code. I don't know the number, but it's gonna be more. So my point is, for example, for Windows 10, I did this math, one person, let's say averagely productive, 300 line of code per day, will need 630 years of, or eight lifetimes to write Windows 10. So there is a ton of code out there, and that's just one system. And similarly, I pulled from Fortune 500 top, uh, top US tech companies by number of employees. Maybe they don't own code, not all of them code, but it's probably proportional, you would guess. So you can see the alphabet, for example, had 119,000 employees coding. So what I'm getting at is that there is so much code, there is a sea of code. But there is no, sh so no shortage of code, but there is a shortage of knowing what to code. There is an order of magnitude, fewer technical leads and managers, uh, product managers, because knowing what to code is the, value, is the more valuable skill and the skill you wanna grow. So good execution at Google is table stakes and you will stand out as an engineer if you understand the product and can answer the why and the what next question. Right. And next, I wanna talk about waterfalls. So what is a waterfall? Waterfall is a traditional approach of building products where you have a product manager Product manager are the smart guys and girls in the room who have all the bright ideas. They write product uh, requirements. Then um, 
Then they hand it off to a designer. Designer designs a mocks. Then they hand it off to the engineer. Engineer plans plans how to build it. Builds the code, and then we make a lot of money because we sell we sell the product. Okay, this is theory. This is this pipeline, and good projects absolutely don't work like this. Only in some high level approximation, yes. So what happens in real life? In real life, you will start designing and you will find a problem with the product requirements. You'll find, for example, you cannot build something. Or you will find some UX component is just too expensive to build in a time frame. You're given a quarter and you need a comp you cannot spend this quarter building one component for like two months. So you already have to go revisit the requirements. Then you, you have the design, you're coding. And when you're coding, you find something. Oh, some migration is going on. Some components not available. Something is mismatching and you have to search. Something is not possible. Again, you go revisit and design and engineering design, and which means engineering revisiting requirements. Then you're not done at all because you're doing testing and you're and our, uh, you collaborating sell sellers do sales. And then they maybe find the problem. Maybe one customer first, your alpha customer implemented your solution and they find a problem. You go revisit your engineering design, you go revisit your code, you maybe go revisit your, your product requirements. So this pipeline just don't, doesn't work. It's, it's nice in theory. In practice, I think about developing products as a collaboration where there is kind of an order like that, but there is a, everyone can look at everything. Uh, so your role is your starting points. You keep an affinity to it, but you behave like an owner of the whole product. So you can do, you, you need to do anything and everything that's required for the product to be successful at some point. For example, hey, your designer is on, on leave. You jump in and you do design. Maybe it won't be so perfect, but you will unblock the project and the design can be polished later. The same with the requirements. Your product manager uh, quit and we're hiring a new one and it takes time and there's no one. What do you do? You jump in and you draft the requirements. Maybe you won't do a perfect job, but you will unblock the project. So velocity over velocity over perfection. I see. Um, oh yeah, uh, signals to watch out for. The uh, typical things that I hear from junior folks, um, thinking about bothering other people. Like I wanna find all the solutions. I don't wanna bother my team. You are not bothering, you are collaborating. So when you think you're, you're all blaming, oh, we are delayed because the designer didn't deliver on time. All designer had to re revise. If you find yourself saying such things, you probably should think about ownership of the project and what you could have done to help the designer not have to revise the design and stuff like that. So you wanna behave like an owner. And most importantly too, everyone can contribute ideas. Hum project, project managers are humans, not gods. They don't know everything. They are good, but they don't know everything. And ideas, come from engineering, from design, from researchers, from sellers, from everyone. Good ideas. So the project will really benefit if everyone behaves like an owner. Cool. Um, next, uh, next point I want to make is about external factors. So what's an internal versus external factor? Internal factors are like your skills, your your abilities, your knowledge, and your experience, projects you've launched, you've completed. And external factors are things like where you choose to work, who is your, uh, what area, what product, your team, your manager, and your project. And when I started at Google, I was very sure internal factors matter the most. If I can um, build the best code, I will be the most successful. That's totally not true. Now, with every year, 
I keep thinking that external factors matter more and more. So what does this mean to us, to engineers? It means that we not only need to get good at coding, but also at picking the right team, picking the right manager, picking the right company with a good culture. Um, and this is tricky because there is no objective criteria, like what's a good manager? Like, it depends. I'll, I think I give some examples in, a slide, in the next slide. <clears throat> So here's a hypothetical question. If we had the uh, in interaction, we could, we could have done a show of hands, but just think to yourself and ask me questions at the end. What would you rather do? Work on a great product with a bad manager, like someone you know, for some reason is a bad manager, or would you work on a bad product, maybe it's not selling, with a great manager, right? So. The, the right answer to this question is that there is no right answer. It really depends. It depends on your goals. Maybe, for example, you want to learn Python. So it doesn't really matter which projects you pick. As long as it's Python project, it will depend on your personality. Maybe you want to deeply research a certain area. Or maybe you want to just like, quickly launch something and make increase revenues, right? That's very different, you would pick up a very different team, very different area for this. Uh, it will depend also on your circumstances. For example, maybe you're just starting a career and the good managers is the most important thing to you at the beginning of your career. So how, how to deal with external factors? Just to summarize, there is no objective uh, advice, but there is, a, but there is advice for your personal situation, a personal preference. For example, um, in the beginning of career, as I mentioned, you want to, so coming back to this question of do you want a good manager and on a bad project or bad projects, on a uh, good project with a bad manager, it really depends. And one, for example, if you're in the beginning of your career, you may want to prefer a good manager. If you're uh, if you're at a later stage, stage of your career, maybe you, you likely wanna, you want to have the manager who let go and stop micromanaging, stop telling you what to do. And then even later, what you need is a charismatic leader who will motivate you. So it really, the answers depend on the personal choices and temporary circumstances will actually, these answers will actually keep changing. Uh, as you go through your career. Uh, the point that I want to make is that be aware that this is important. Uh, and look for answers with intention. And it no one actually knows these things at the beginning of their career, maybe even later too. These are hard to know. So it's just hard to know what you want in some sense in your career, like that dreaded question, what do you want to do five years from now? That doesn't make much sense. No one knows. No one knows. Uh, maybe like if you're very later stages, but in general, you don't know. So what you want to do, you want to periodically think about it and make epsilon improvements, make some course corrections to go towards what you want and figure out over time what you want. And my last point, I think very quickly, advocating for yourself. So this took me a few years to realize, I have to admit. People at Google are extremely smart, well-intentioned, extremely helpful when asked. This is true. They are just amazing people. This is the best company I ever worked for. But it's also true that everyone cares for their career first. So how many people wake up in the morning and think, what Ella should do in her career? Like no one, maybe me, maybe not that often, maybe my manager sometimes, maybe a good mentor, but it's very scarce. So who needs to be in charge of what has to happen in your career? You have to be. And I found it the hard way 
for something like two years. I was just complaining every day about a lot of things and kind of waiting for guidance. I thought my manager would tell me exactly what I need to do in my career. And my manager would, would at best ask me questions what I want to do. So it took me a long, long time to realize that I need to be in charge of my career. I need to figure out what I want. No one, no one will ever tell me. So I need to figure out what skills I want to require and what kind of growth I am looking for. Once you know what you want, then you ask your mentors and manager for help to getting there. So this is a huge topic, advocating for yourself. Uh, so I just want to mention one thing, and that uh, workshop is uh, about communication. That's a perfect complement to this to this point. Um, speaking with confidence. So one one of the most useful things that I've done is use the Gmail's undo feature. So it's up to thirty seconds to read it the email, and you can cancel it and resend it again. I do this all the time cancel and edit something. So I, I look for the self undermining language that comes uh, kind of, I don't know from where, but I find myself saying these things, maybe, maybe perhaps we should consider, or this is a silly comment, or this is such a silly question, or this is such a noob, noob, noob question, um, probably stupid, but like, why don't we? I'm sorry to listen. So you find, I find myself typing these things all the time. And then in the 30 seconds, I delete, 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 and say instead, let's do X. Or my idea is to do Y, what do you think? So that, that's about advocating. And there is a ton of materials on the subject. I'm happy to talk more about this. And I think this is my last slide. This is the summary. Happy to answer any questions. Hi, Ella. That was so great. <laughs> Lots of gems. I was writing some things about, you know, obviously encouraging us to break, break the rules, right? To test different things out. And I really love this one thing that you said that you're not bothering someone, you're collaborating. And I think, you know, I want to sit with that. It's very powerful. And it's also going to be the theme of our next talk, right? Collaborative leadership. And I think that's very, very, very important. So we have a few questions. Um, I will... oh, where do I look? Should, should I open the chat? Um, there's a, I could read them to you or do you want yeah. to read them? Oh, go um... for it. Okay. Go for it. Does someone ask, do you miss coding after leaving it all together? How do you stay I up do. to date? Yeah. <laughs> How do you stay I up do. to date? <laughs> I do, but I tell you something. Mm. There, there was a moment in my career when I it was a clear switch from coding to being a leader. Uh, I launched externally at Google I.O. something very big. And like the day earlier, it was a very visible project. So I talked to my VP and he's like, Ella, just don't leave. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is so exciting. We're launching tomorrow. And then launch comes. An hour after, I'm like, this is boring. Like, I've launched this big thing. It took like two years. Uh, it was very long and hectic. And we we made it la last minute. Uh, everything was happening. And we barely made it. And that, he was so right. Like, the moment after you do that, you feel, oh, this is no longer interesting. What's the next hard problem? And then, you know, the next hard problem is too big for me to code. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you try to code, yes, it's nice. It's rewarding in the moment, but you feel like you're just this one person. What can you do in one? You need like, you need to have a few people do it with you and then it will be big. So it becomes, yes, I miss it, but also I don't because I know I can have much more influence if I figure out what's the right thing to do and I collaborate with my engineers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, so many, so many good questions. Um, I could read them a couple to you and then you kind of decide which ones you might want to answer. All right. So someone said earlier, you said something about um, not letting the perfect be your enemy. So does this also mean not compromising quality of your project to some degree, mm -hmm. if yes, why? Oh, then, why? Yeah. Well, if you compromise quality, then you're a shitty engineer. 
<laughs> so don't compromise, compromise quality. The tough part is to figure out what doesn't matter, what you don't want to do. This is thinking out of, outside of the box. You try to cut corners, but those corners that don't matter, right? Not every corner. Something like so. It's a really prioritization exercise. Mm -hmm. But stay high quality. Okay. <laughs> so, so I don't know who asked this, if, if they have a follow up to this. The way I think about this, and I tell my people, you don't want to work more hours because that doesn't scale. You want to be more effective per hour. Okay. So you want to grow your impact every hour. And if you spend an hour coding something useless or something that's like nice, but who cares? You could have done something better with that time, right? So you wanna optimize your time, not increase the amount of time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, um, is agile method the better model? I see many companies having that in their job requirements. Why is it better than waterfall and why do most companies go for it? We actually don't use it at all. Uh, very rarely at Google. No one does Agile. I don't. Um, like, I have a strong point of view on this. Um, so it depends. There are projects where Agile is appropriate. When pro I would say it's appropriate when you know very well what to do. Like, the challenge of what to do is small and it's just a, like here's a big pile of work hey let's pick it up and let's monitor and let's predict when it's gonna land great a lot of project problems that i deal with they are hard the the stack is of ad, ads i worked a lot in ads 20 year old stack ten thousand people working on it okay it is complicated it has so many backends so to do something the challenge isn't to like spread around work the challenge is to ask, assign our owners to problems, and then you own this problem, and like you only become an expert in this problem, and you will implement it. Like, there's a giant model that doesn't work in my area. <laughs> that might be a surprise to some. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it depends. Yeah. And then Google now agile. It exists. Some teams do, but very few. What do you call it? Someone's asking. Okay, so, and then let's see, another question. Um, how can you identify a good manager and how can you identify the best team with prior experience? Why did I think someone will, will ask this? I have an extra slide. <laughs> I thought I heard <laughs> someone will ask this. Um, that. <laughs> it is very hard and you get better at this. And there is like, like, so think what you want in your manager and think what kind of question you want to ask them. So basically interview your manager and interview people he, man he or she manages. That's the TLDR of it. And think what's the smart questions to ask? What do you want to hear from him? What do you want the manager to be like? What is the question? And what, how do you gauge response for example, if you want a manager who cares for your career and you ask what kind of projects they have in mind for you, they'll be like, it's like C++ and like they jump right into this and it uses this microservice and uses this technology. Hey, you didn't ask technology, you asked growth. So your manager needs to respond with, oh, I think I'll give you a small starter project and you will work, you will learn to collaborate and I will also make you, uh, give you opportunity to present your work. And I think a year from now, you should land this, this project. And based on that, I would expect you, will, you know, a conversation needs to be like that, not technical. So that's like one. So you get better at this kind of how to interview your manager, uh, kind of, uh, it's a skill. So I wrote some questions, like what I would, what I would do. For example, I check if teams are diverse. If everyone looks the same, it's a, to me at least big red flag. Uh, and it doesn't that's not just women. It's like across the board, you want diversity. That means that it's a good manager because people come there. And if it's just one type of person, whatever that is, even just like just women, and something is weird. Then you want mix. Uh, if the team is too big. And no human can manage like really well over 10 people. You just don't have capacity for it. So if you have a manager with 20 people, you know they will never have time for you. Okay, stop. So you need then a mentor or some solution because over 10 people, they never have time. Some research shows that 
the, the line is seven, let's say seven. I put it at 10, let's say, but if more, it's becoming a scale. No, if you have more, then you have to have like a small mentor who work with you at day to day. And a lot of other questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I wanna go, I, I don't wanna monopolize on this one question. So yeah, I guess the last one, let's see. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, it says, love the mythical man month. What's something you think would come in the book if it was released again today? I don't get the question. Oh, apologies. There's some shuffling around here. Okay. Uh -huh. um, this might be related to what you were just speaking about. So how do you convince your boss and company to find a product manager when you don't have one and they insist we don't need it, but it makes work kind of hard? I've been in such situations. That's hard. I mean, you need to advocate, you need to make a point very well why you need a product manager to basically fund a role in your horizontal team that you're missing. And it doesn't have to be product manager. There can be, I've seen very like infra focused teams without product managers. They sometimes don't perform that well. And I've seen cases where you, you're missing a certain link in, in your, in your kind of circle of collaborators. Um, I say sometimes, this, you know what, I've learned this. It just takes some evangelizing and some time. You cannot expect that you go to your VP and like, hey, I need X, hire the man, hire person X in one day. But guess what? That VP will remember. And then you complain next, next quarter or something, and then one more, and you know what? This will materialize. If you have arguments, it just, the expectation isn't like immediate. Once they can make it, they will make it if it's a reasonable request, right? That's kind of my take. Great, thank you. I think that's about all the time we have um, for this talk. Really appreciate you making the time to come talk with us. Thank you so much, Ella. Hopefully you could stick around. We're gonna jump in. I will, I will yeah. a little bit, yeah. 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 Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, feel free to send me feedback. Let me go back to my, that's my email. Perfect. I'm happy to get feedback more. I see more questions. Feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, virtual claps. <laughs> Thank you. So let's see, I am gonna jump back on to presenting. Can you see my presentation on your end? Not yet. Okay, how about it's now? It's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, do you see my presentation? Yes, Great. we do. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick uh, five minute break. I think we're just gonna hang out in this room or we're gonna do breakout rooms actually. So um, we're gonna set you up in different breakout rooms and you know, just give us a moment to just <laughs> connect with each other. Feel free to share what you've learned, um, get up and stretch. I know that's what I'm gonna do and come back and join us for our next workshop, which is a communication and public speaking workshop by Present Voices. And don't forget to sign up um, to join our raffle. The link is right there. Conversations in your breakout rooms. Good to see you, Leia. All good? Super excited for our next our next speaker. Let me see if I could share on my end. Bear with me one second. Welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> oh, I just love Zoom. <laughs> Let's see. Do you see that on my presentation on my end? It's coming up, it's coming up. How about now? 
Yes, we do. <laughs> Great. Leah, how's everything? All good? Are you all, all right. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much again, everyone, for you know managing through our technical snafus. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed connecting in the different rooms. I know I had a good time bouncing around, meeting a few people that I've, you know, new people I haven't met yet. And all thanks to this virtual space, I'm able to connect with you all. So I'm super excited for this next workshop. We have the fabulous Leah Von Masuto, who's a communications coach and founder at Present Voices. And she's gonna be leading a interact, what we hope is an interactive workshop on competent communications being heard in the virtual world. Very excited to hear what she has to say about this. Um, with Present Voices, you know, she's been helping so many leaders learn to speak more confidently when it matters most. And she does this through communication coaching and through community like this. She is passionate about dismantling the systems that are silencing voices in our society. And she combines skill, evidence-based tools and real work experience in dress, conversational communication, presentation skills, presence, confidence, and leadership style. I'm so excited to be a part of your presentation, Leia. It is not easy as someone who is emceeing this event and has done so in person. I'm very, very excited to hear what you have to say of how do we transition those skills into a virtual space and do it confidently and with power and presence. So I'll let you take it away. And everyone, please you know, feel free to drop any questions you have uh, during the workshop in the Slido and we'll include that in the chat. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. And I want to begin by thanking the organizers of this event, Anna, Ava, Carolina, all of the Google developers and women tech makers. And I'm going to share my screen now. All right. So everyone, I know that we are only seeing faces right now of the organizers, of the co-hosts. And so if that is something that can be changed, that's awesome. It would be great to have more faces. If not, we will do it presentational mode, everyone. And so as we begin today, we're going to talk about confident communication and being heard in the virtual world. And it is my goal today to leave you all with very practical tools that you can put into practice tomorrow. And tomorrow is Saturday, so maybe you won't put them into practice tomorrow. Maybe you'll take a day off for the weekend. But my goal is for these to be super practical and actionable tools that will make sense in our virtual world. And when we're thinking about our virtual world, we're really thinking about how to make this space more confident, safer, and more inclusive. And I, I want to speak to what happened during Ella's wonderful presentation, but there was a Zoom bomb happening that some of you probably noticed in the chat. And that can create so much fear and it is so scary. And so I have to create some space for what happened to, uh, oh, to put my heart out to Ella for having to deal with that. Hopefully she didn't see it. It was momentary, but these are the sorts of things that are happening in our virtual spaces. There are aggressions that have been happening in our very real spaces for so many people. And we're gonna talk today about how to make this mode more safe, more inclusive, more confident and more clear. And so as we do, we're re-emerging right now, right? A year ago, we did this event. It was supposed to be in person. It was turned into virtual and we were just thrown into this new life. And now we're a year later, we're starting to re-emerge from it. But still, I think we can all agree that virtual spaces are truly here to stay. They're not going anywhere. And so as we enter year two of our not so new virtual reality, how can we be more present, more powerful, and more on purpose in these spaces? Virtual spaces are personal spaces. And this is something that I have been talking about for a year because it's just so important. As we just witnessed less than an hour ago, these spaces can be invaded, they can be un not safe. And then at work, this can happen as well. And so it's really important to prioritize these four pillars of communication when it comes to virtual spaces, consent, clarity, inclusion, and confidence, right? And everyone, you see, I have some sunshine coming in here. Give me a moment. These are the things that we're managing in our virtual spaces, right? 
changes in our in our spaces, in our sunshine, literally as we're going, we're having to make adjustments. And so how can we make sure that this space feels good for us, that we feel safe here? When I talk about clarity, what I'm talking about is everyone is muted right now, right? That's something that we all know. Can everyone see and hear me okay? Is my technical connection all right? Can you give me a nod? Yeah. If that changes, can you go like this? Raise your hand if you've been in a virtual meeting in the last year where someone's technical difficulties crept on and no one told them and they might have not known. So this is really happening in our spaces and the more that we can have clarity, the more that people will be heard. I have a link here that I'm going, I can't drop in the chat, but we're going to send it to you later, which is a sign up link for the slides from what I'm going to talk about today and also a list of resources. So I'm going to share that with the organizers in a bit. They'll share it with you. And if you'd like to get a copy of the slides from today, fill out that form and you will receive them. It will also sign you up for my list. I email out about once a week. So that's what I'm talking about with clarity. With consent, we are recording today, but if anyone wants to share something, speak up, have their voices heard, and you want us to turn off the recording for a moment, just reach out to us and we can do that, we can pause it. That's something that I, I want to see more in our spaces, are people asking for consent and when recording, as the organizers did today, which is so wonderful. But how can we all feel more agency when things are being recorded, when the screenshots are being taken? And so also thinking about inclusion for how to interact. Right now, not everyone is able to interact here because we're in more of a presentational format, but everyone can use nonverbal feedback. That's available at the bottom of Zoom or also in the participants window. You can actually tell me if I'm going too quickly. You can ask me to slow down. You can give a thumbs up. All of those nonverbal feedback cues is a great way for this to be as inclusive as possible tell me if I'm going too quickly. And also a good way for inclusion is to put your pronouns in your name on Zoom or any other video conference software that you're using. Normally I would invite everyone to have their videos on, but organizers, I don't think that people can put their videos on today because I'm, I'm not sure what the settings are, but just so everyone knows that that might be a concern. And confidence. So Ella did this so well. Ella said, you have, I have a toddler outside. You might hear her. She's well taken care of. She said it with confidence. And I'm a big believer that we should say these things with confidence and not with apologies. So I could say, I also have a toddler out there. You might hear her. Or you could say during a meeting, I might be getting a delivery soon and it might interrupt me. You don't have to apologize when you say things like this. So this is what we're here to talk about is this virtual world and how we can make it safer and more inclusive for all types of voices. And as we move there, I wanna tell you a little bit more about myself. My name is Leah Bonvasudo and I am a communication coach and co-founder and founder of Present Voices. And I help people speak with more power and presence on video. I was a theater director for many years and I felt very confident leading my teams. But the moment I had to talk about myself, it was like my personality shut down, my nerves came on and my mind went blank. Not only were the nerves debilitating, but almost more so the shame around the nerves were so massive. I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about it or admit it. And over the last 10 years, I've developed a process of tangible tools that have helped thousands of people in industries from tech to healthcare to media feel more confident and in control of their off the cuff communication. Today, I work with individuals and teams to help them speak off the cuff and communicate with more confidence. I have a ton of spatial and vocal privilege, and it's really important to talk about that. It's a big part of what we're going to talk about. And as a white person, that is something that I have to use in order to create space for voices. But it is my mission to dismantle systems that are oppressing voices so that more types of voices can be heard. We're gonna talk about that a lot in our panel shortly, and we're going to talk about that here. Now, everyone, I take a good amount of data a lot of my clients are data, data leaders. I'm massively inspired by them. And I collect data because it makes this soft skills work that much more tangible. 
And sadly, my data is showing that everyone is suffering, truly almost everyone. The numbers were this high pre-pandemic. 86.7% of people are experiencing debilitating nerves when they're speaking at work. 96.1% of people right now are experiencing anxiety at work. 85.9% of people do not feel prepared for spontaneous speaking. And I'm gonna sit here, I wanted to see hands here, but for those of you who can't raise hands, I want you to even do it while we can't see you. Raise your hand if you experience nerves when you're trying to articulate yourself off the cuff. Raise your hand if you have palpitations that happen for seemingly no reason, that shake your entire solar plexus and make it hard to speak. Oh, the hands are raising. Raise your hands if your, choke, your throat constricts or you feel like you can't catch your breath sometimes. Raise your hand if you have racing thoughts, if you feel like you don't belong sometimes at work, if you feel like you're not being heard. Yeah. And so everyone, there are so many hands being raised in this group that so many of us are experiencing this. So many of your teammates are experiencing this. And in fact, your managers and your superiors. And how can we create more safety in our spaces? How can we do this for everyone and each other? We're going to move now into thinking about how we can preserve our energy on Zoom because I know everyone here, regardless of whether you're an essential worker working on the front lines or you are on Zoom all day, everyone knows how emotionally draining this past year has been. And so when we're on video calls and those of us who are on video calls all day, we have to preserve our energy because this mode of communication is a microscope for our presence. It's exhausting. And the reason why is because 93% of communication is nonverbal, is everything but the words. And that's 93%. And when we are in these virtual spaces, we are losing a lot of that 93%. That 93% is made up of facial expression, tone of voice, body language, eye contact. Technical difficulties can make most of those things go away, right? Or just what I'm choosing to show on the screen can obscure those nonverbal feedback cues. And so those of us who are speaking or receiving we are doing a lot of emotional work to fill that gap that's created in the virtual world, right? We're nodding a lot, we're leaning in, we're making ourselves small, we're trying to get a word in, right? Is everyone feeling the amount of effort that we're putting in in these video calls? Even when we're not speaking, we're just moving so much. And this is all diminishing our hormonal confidence. And this is because of the studies done by Amy Cuddy and John Neffinger and Matthew Kohut around embodied cognition. And the idea that if we take up more space, we actually feel more confident. And so trying to get a word in or making ourselves small, leaning in all the way so that we can interject and get a word in is actually damaging our hormonal confidence. And instead we need to practice taking up space. So on video, I prioritize three S words. They all start with S. They're really easy to remember. Silence, spaciousness, and stillness. All of these are very counterintuitive. Our mind tells us to do the opposite. Remember, it tells us to make ourselves small and speak really quickly so that we can really not, not be interrupted before we get everything in what we need to say. That is then signaling to ourselves that we have a reason to feel threatened. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit coming up because that is very much a realism for too many people in our American workplace. But if you can prioritize your comfort first and foremost, you are going to signal to your own body that you are safe, safer, and that can start a healthy feedback loop between the mind and body connection to set you up for more confidence. And so everyone, wherever you are right now, can you prioritize feeling comfortable in your chair? Can you lean back? Maybe leaning back makes you feel further away from the screen. I'm going to challenge you to think of that as a good thing, but you can always scoot your chair in if you want. And I even have a pillow back here to prop me up. When you're leaning back, you can do what I call the pull. 
And this is so cool. Instead of me feeling like I have to push everything into the screen, I think of it as pulling my audience to me. All of this is going to help your ability to exert less and preserve your energy on Zoom. Now you will naturally go right back to your habitual behavior always. This work always works that way. But then when you realize it, you can reset to comfort. We're gonna talk a bit about in the panel how I really believe that you can't communicate with confidence unless you feel physically comfortable. And if you envision the speakers, the leaders you know who exhibit the most comfort and confidence, they're usually sitting in a really comfortable way. So prioritize your own comfort. You can also hear how I'm modulating my vocal volume a little bit. I'm actually pulling my vocal volume back about to, to about 75%. This is enabling that I'm not pushing my vocal volume too much. Zoom and other video conference platforms do a good amount to pick up speaker volume and to minimize background noise. And so you can pull your volume back to about 75%. And just by doing that, it creates this pull effect where I'm bringing people to me. For the faces I can see, can you hear me okay? Is my volume all right? Yeah. And so we don't want to push too much. It is what's creating so much emotional drainage. Now, this has a few caveats. First of all, I only put this practice into place, what I'm talking about, these tools, into practice in my most important meetings because presence is so exhausting. You really wanna reserve this for the moments that are important. You cannot do this if you're in video meetings all day. Choose one or two meetings a day that really require your presence and attention and focus there. And this is also going to vary greatly, of course, based on the power and privilege in a space. What I'm speaking about, which is really about how we can put in less effort into our video communication is for people who feel like they don't have enough power and privilege at work in your spaces. For the leaders in our space who are holding more power and privilege, it is your responsibility actually to put in more effort, to put in the effort to encourage your team to speak, to bring them out and to ask what they need their virtual spaces to be like in order for them to feel heard and safe. So everyone, we're gonna practice this all together, everyone's on mute, and that is the way it will be. But we're going to practice because we're all on mute and we can speak without being heard. So everyone, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself on mute. No one's going to hear you. We're all going to say, hi, my name is, my role is. And I'm going to ask you to practice saying this from a place of comfort, leaning back. You might also Feel your contact points where your body hits the chair, just melt to melt where your body hits the chair into the floor. Another idea, you might feel your foot on the floor and feel your foot sink into the floor. Help you prioritize your own comfort. And within that, to pull your vocal volume back to about 75%, to think of pulling your audience to you. And so we're going to practice this by saying, my name is, my role is, introducing yourself on mute. All right, everyone, let's do it in three, two, one. Hi, my name is Leah Bombasudo. I'm a communication coach and founder of Present Voices. Don't stop yourself if you're still speaking, fantastic. So everyone, practicing this is essential because it doesn't necessarily feel natural. It's something I always tell my clients that this isn't natural. If it was natural, we wouldn't be working on it. We're working on it because this is rooted in our own habitual behavior and we are moving to expand the range of our own habitual behavior. And so practicing it is important in order to make it feel more natural, but it won't be natural at first. The big thing to pay attention to is that you want it to feel comfortable. As I said, you have to prioritize your own comfort. And so now we're going to move into a big topic that I know is important for so many of you. This is the biggest question I hear from my clients right now. And this is how can I be heard without interrupting on Zoom? 
In our video meetings, I know you all know far more than me, we are speaking over each other. There is so much cacophony of sound happening. People are leaning in, they're interrupting, they're not creating any air. And this is only serving very particular types of voices. The thing I wanna say about the types of voices who are perpetuating this, who are probably some of the people in charge is that they could be doing a better job of communicating. They could be doing a better job of creating space. It's what I was talking about up above, that it really falls on the responsibility of leadership to find ways to make sure that everyone's voices are heard. That being said, my clients who are leaders, they speak fast and they keep speaking through silence, not because they intend to interrupt, but because they want to carry the conversational responsibility. They feel responsible. And this is good intentions. And so how can you tell if your environment is because of good intentions or bad intentions? We can't truly, unless we're having those deeper conversations. That's something I recommend. Have these deeper conversations with your team. Make it a plan for how to let people know when there's technical difficulties, how to manage people's ability to feel heard, and how to have a commonality in the language. I run these corporate team workshops for groups all over the country and all over the world. They're incredibly, incredibly impactful for that point. But the bigger point is that our communication is contagious. So if everyone's speaking over each other and trying to get a word in, such it will be. And so we have to create spaces that are much more measured in their pace and that are serving everyone's voices. First of all, if you feel the need to interrupt, just remember that you will not be served by interrupting and trying to fit what you wanna say into a tiny bit of a hair and rushing to do so. So what I recommend doing is, what I just did was I took the conversation you want to wait for the hair of a pause and you want to take the conversation with filler, intentional filler. Once you have the conversation, you can look away to signal that you're thinking, to have a reset button, to ground yourself again. And then you don't even have to continue the same thought when you begin speaking again. But you are taking the conversation in order to reset the pace and pull people towards you. Once you're speaking, and this is totally counterintuitive. How can you not rush? It is absolutely in our impulse to rush when the pace of the conversation is fast. But then we are signaling to ourselves that we should go faster and that what we have to say is less important. And so do not let them rush you. Some techniques around that are to use the breath to really honor your innate rhythm and so what I just did, as you can see, I took a pause at the change of a thought in order to reground myself in breath and to create a different pace. You could also do what I'm doing right now, which is saying every word that's coming out of my mouth. It's really, really awkward for me, but no one can tell that. And so that will naturally create a slowing down of the overall pace. Oh, and one of my favorites for all of you who speak in acronyms all day, and I know on your teams, acronyms are just the shorthand to get things done more quickly. If there's certain acronyms that you say every day, can you actually say each letter when you say that acronym? So A, B, C, and that will serve as a speed bump to slow down your overall ability of rate of speech. Finally, my last tip about getting a word in is on your feet, can you restructure your ideas so that the biggest idea is at the top? This is about starting at the conclusion. And this, another way of thinking about this is to articulate the headline of your response and starting there. Like with most things in communication, this is counterintuitive. We have been socialized and taught to, to tell stories from A to B to C, with the Z being the conclusion. We've been taught to build our case to get there. And I'm asking you to reverse this, to start with the big idea, with the headline, with the conclusion, and then back it up. But start there so that you are capturing everyone and speaking from a high level perspective. And finally, we're going to practice what we just spoke about, which is the breath. 
so much of our virtual world is taking us up and out of our bodies. And that's what being on our phones does to us. That's what being in video calls all day do does to us. When I was a very amateur programmer and I would be coding websites all day, this was something I would experience so deeply. If I was sitting on the couch with my laptop for eight hours, I would come out of it and feel like I haven't taken a breath all day. Our breath is our internal rhythm. It's our source. For the people who come to see me because they lose their train of thought or their mind goes blank or they have very intense physiological sensations, which about 85% of us do, this is almost always the key, almost always. And so we're going to practice it for a moment here of actually allowing our bodies to breathe, to sink down into breath, and this is 3D breath. We've, we've probably heard of this as diaphragmatic breathing, but it's the idea of actually allowing your belly to expand as you inhale and to let your belly contract as you exhale. And so let's just practice this right now together. We can all use a little bit of this right now, especially at the end of a long work week. And so as you inhale, can you feel your belly button move away from your spine? And as you exhale, can you feel your belly button move towards your spine? And as in this GIF, you can make it go more slowly so that it's actually regulating your central nervous system and pulling back the overall pace that you feel that your system is going in. So everyone, as we begin to wrap up today, This is all a work in progress. And I'm a really big believer in the fact that our voices are perfect, that they are exactly as they should be, that environments can make that more challenging for us to honor our innate voices, but that we really all do come from a place of strength when we can truly honor our own voices and be ourselves. It's something we'll talk about a lot in the panel that's upcoming. I encourage you to visit my website, presentvoices.co. You can sign up for my newsletter there. I'm gonna see if I can chat this link. No, I don't, uh, I might be able to. Let's see, yes, I can. So everyone, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. And this is a link to sign up for my list. This is a special link. So if you sign up at this link, you're going to get an automatic um, load for the slides and the resources that go with it. It will automatically direct you to that page on my website, all right? Also, I want everyone to know to follow me on Instagram if you'd like and to get in touch. I offer free consultations for my private coaching. I'm also off of launching my group coaching program in the next few weeks. I only do that a few times a year. So if you're interested, head to presentvoices.co and let me know. And if we have time for questions, I'll leave that up to the moderators. I would love to answer any that have been submitted. Thank yeah, you all thank so you. much. Thank you, Leah. That was great. <laughs> Definitely, I'm now sitting back, you know, enjoying my comfort and trying to channel that into speaking more clearly, right, and more confidently. So thank you so much for sharing all those incredible gems. I was taking notes, and I hope everyone was as well. We have a few questions here. Um, so yeah, people, you know, acknowledging the Zoom bombing. Thank you so much actually for acknowledging that, right? It's a very real and it was a very practical, tangible thing that we all experienced. And I know us on the back end, we were freaking out. So thank you for just making us more mindful and aware of just the different things that go into recognizing um, how to communicate in a virtual space. So questions are, as a person who interrupts unintentionally with ADHD, other than interrupting myself when I realize and apologizing, how can I make sure others don't get frustrated? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. So those of us who feel the need to interject, I do too. It, for me, it's totally rooted in what I call conversational responsibility. I don't want to put the onus on someone else. And it really is so rooted in good intentions for most people, for 99.9% .9 of people. And so what I have to do in those moments, first of all, is recognize that it is an innate behavior that I'm trying to change and to be graceful with myself as the habit continues to need to be worked on. And then once you're there for you to bring your attention to the breath, and I do this, I call it ocean breath. It's not, it's not me. It's a yogic breathing technique. It's millennia years old. And it goes like this. I can hear it. Other people can't. I'm doing it very loud just for all of your benefit. 
But I do that as my listening mechanism. By listening to the sound of my own breath, I'm actually listening to everything that's happening around me. And it gives me something proactive to do that prevents me from jumping right in and cutting someone off. And then if you do cut someone off, just communicate about it. You know, that's a great opportunity to intentionally apologize. I'm all about intentional apologizing and not unconsciously apologizing, but certainly that's a good opportunity to communicate about it and to talk about talking and making sure that the space feels safe. Great, thank you. So another question, how do newbies in tech get their voices heard without feeling out of place? When can we feel eligible to be heard? Is there a time span that we should be aware of? Wow. Mm -hmm. My hope, and we're going to talk about this deeply in the panel, is that we're going to be working for organizations that want to hear from our voices at the individual contributor level all the way up through all levels of management. And for us to look for organizations that are supporting that from day one. And so I support startups that are three people strong right now and everyone is getting coaching and everyone is having a voice and so I believe this should start on day one and if it is not being nurtured that is something to question we are in a world now where we need to hear from voices and we need leadership that is not threatened and that is collaborative that's what our panel is all about <laughs> and so I know that that is wishful thinking and many people are unfortunately in organizations that are not quite there yet. And so look for people you can trust. This is something that is talked about very much in lots of different studies about cultural environments and what feels safe and what doesn't. And so people finding safety within those spaces is key. And then from there, advocating and articulating yourself. And Anything that makes you doubt the confidence of your own voice is a red flag and something that needs to be talked about and questioned. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, looking forward to that panel and collaborative leadership. So next question is I stutter and I know it's something that's deeply rooted. I usually become extremely aware of myself while talking to anyone. How can I overcome this? Thank you. Yeah, the stutter is a very real thing rooted in a lot of trauma and I'm seeing it with my three-year-old right now, the way that she's criticized as she begins to learn language. And this is something that can be deeply, deeply damaging. The stutter is something that we can you know, deal with in speech pathology and that in itself can sometimes be damaging in different ways. But the uh, undercurrent that's really, I think the most damaging is the anxiety. And so if I had a stutter as a kid, but then the anxiety is the voices in my head when I go to speak or I'm put on the spotlight that say, you're going to stutter, you're not going to be able to get your words out, you're going to not be able to articulate. The anxiety is what we have to deal with, not the stutter. We have to deal with the ability to reground and get present into our bodies in order to listen to ourselves and what we want to say. There are technical tools to deal with the stutter. The anxiety is priority number one. Mm, yeah. So one final question due to time, and then we'll jump into breakout sessions where we could continue you know, having these conversations. So last question, how do you manage when you are trying to have a conversation with someone who will go on and off talking, not giving you time to participate in the conversation? Yeah. Like I said, this is often due to their own insecurity almost always. And so just by seeing that, especially if there's a power dynamic at play, that can be an interesting way to reframe the situation. But you absolutely want to look for those pockets of air where you actually interject your voice. And so just like that, even if they then continue on for you to actually interject your voice and get your voice in the space. In some virtual settings, that might mean chatting. It might mean using nonverbal feedback. But in any space where we want to hear your voice and your voice is not being heard, this is something that really needs to be worked on. And for those of you at other levels of leadership in those spaces where you're seeing those people not being able to be heard, this is where your responsibility comes in. And so how can we create spaces where everyone is heard? Thank you so much, Leah. That yeah. was that was great. Thank you so much. And thank really you, everyone. Fun. Yeah, everyone, please stick around. Leah is going to be joining us for our panel after a short break. That panel is on collaborative leadership, how to lead with our most authentic selves. So we're going to jump to a quick break right now, and then we'll rejoin in about 10 or so minutes. 
Thank you, Leia. Virtual claps. Thank you. <laughs> the breakout rooms are open. Feel free to choose a room you like. As we said, the squares on the bottom of your screen, you can click on them and choose a topic that you want to join. Yep, I think everyone's being pushed back. In Speakers, you are on mute, please unmute. Great, Ralph, Ava? <laughs> I'm mute. <laughs> Super. Great. Okay. All our speakers are here. Perfect. I'm super welcome back, everyone. Hope that was fun. Hope it gave you another opportunity to connect, to you know, learn more and even use that space uh, to to show off your new confident public speaking skills that we just learned in our workshop with Leah. So I am so excited to moderate this conversation on collaborative leadership, leading with our full selves. We have an amazing, let's see, amazing speakers with us this evening. We have um, Dr. McCabe Williams, Director of Division of Academic Specialists in Obstetrician and Gynecology um, and a prof Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. We have Ingrid Gonzalez. She's the head of sales at Google Cloud New York and the chairwoman and president of Positive Planet US. We have Leia joining us again. Leia uh, is the com communication coach and founder at Present Voices. And we have Portia Monroe, who's the learning and development specialist at Netflix. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I guess, you know, best place to start is introductions. If you could just introduce yourselves, share a little bit more about um, your journey and where you are in your current role at your current organization. Hey. Absolutely. So we we'll start. So uh, I just want to start saying thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a late hour on Friday, and uh, this is definitely our time. This is your time. Uh, so my name is Ingrid Gonzalez, and uh, I just want to share a little bit about my background. So um, I grew up in the mountain in the south of France. Uh, so I, I come from a very poor family, uh, very diverse, very international, Italian, Spanish roots. Uh, I grew up in a 500 people town <laughs> where they were more animals than human beings, but with determination and greed. I had the opportunity to graduate from a, a master's degree in entrepreneurship from a top business school in Europe. And uh, I've been for the past 17 years in tech, technology, innovation. I work for the four largest companies in the world, IBM, Dell, Microsoft, and, uh, and Google in three different continents. And uh, I today, I, I just wanted to introduce myself as a, a really representing two of the largest uh, organization I'm passionate about. One is Google. Google is a positive planet. Uh, positive planet is my passion, is my life, is a nonprofit organization that I uh, um, had the opportunity uh, to lead since uh, the past July, since the pandemic. And the goal of Positive Planet is to support underserved community, uh, to leave poverty uh, through entrepreneurship. And, and today themes was, was all about, and I was very excited and, and be with all of you because uh, the, the theme was, what does collaborative leadership means to me, Ingrid? So as a leader, your purpose is to really create a diverse and inclusive environment and, um, you know, where everyone feels value included and have a voice. So I have decided uh, to lead by example. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a like, share a little story with you about what happened last year during the pandemic. Uh, I was not very happy. I was lonely. I was sad and very, very isolated. And I, I decided to leave America to uh, 
to be close to my family back in France, in Europe, and uh, and find support and comfort like many of you had. So right away, I went to my HR lead and uh, expressed the desire to leave the country and to be and to foster an environment around me where I could be me and could have a voice and, and definitely uh, connect with my organization, with myself and with my team. And uh, it was not easy, but very uh, uh, because I had a voice, because I expressed a desire, uh, I made that happen. Uh, and uh, I was very excited to, uh, to, to, to leave and to be close to uh, an environment where I felt like I could, you know, be me again and express myself. I give the best to my organization, to my team, and and to uh, and to my family as well. So, what I want to share with all of you today, in terms of you know, the theme of collaboration, it it changed my entire life. It changed my entire team dynamic. Everyone, because they saw me, I was doing it. Everyone felt relaxed. So ready to give their best, ready also to be able and say, okay, I want to do the same. I wanted to create and foster an environment around me where I can be me, when I can collaborate, when I can be myself and can give the best. And um, what I want to share with all of you tonight is that thanks to that in environment that you personally create around yourself, uh, you can make the impossible be possible. And I just want to share with you some numbers is that Last year, we were awarded at Google as being the top performing team in America. We received a Stratosphere Award, top recognition in the world during the time where, you know, New York was hit at the worst. But because we re-evaluate re the way we were talking, engaging, collaborating, and respecting each other and meeting each other where we were in our life, in our personal life and professional life, we were able to be uh, extremely successful. So I'm very excited to be with all of you tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A and, and to get to know you better and share with you a little bit more about my experience. But um, thank you very much again for joining us and uh, um, I would be happy to uh, take any questions for that. Thank you, Ingrid. Maybe Dr. McCabe, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your, um, your role in your organization. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join this conversation about I think I was muted. I'm so sorry. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join this conversation about collaborative leadership and to honor International Women's History Month. As a woman, a Black woman, as a women's health provider, it is such an honor to join this conversation because at the intersection of women's health and empowerment and education is where my passion lies. So I am a mother, I am a partner, and I am a leader. I lead a division of about 21 physicians and an additional 20 advanced practice providers at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And in that role, I am responsible for the clinical mission as well as the academic mission of our general obstetrics and gynecology division. So when we talk about collaborating, when we talk about caring and compassion and leadership, it is really fundamental to everything that I do as a leader. Whether or not I'm in a delivery room assisting with bringing new life into the world and the operating room, leading a team that's helping me perform surgery, or if it's in the classroom where I'm teaching the next generation of residents and medical students how to care for women, um, collaborating with these multidisciplinary teams is critical. And I will tell you over this past year, the past 13 months, the concept and notion of collaborative leadership has just gone to the next level for me because certainly we wouldn't have been able to do what we needed to do as a team without that collaborative approach. I'll just you know take you back a year uh, in the past um, on a Friday evening it was March 13th 
Uh, you know what they say about Friday the 13th. Well, it was a very harrowing uh, day for me. It was very clear at that moment for me that our team was going to have to have this all hands on deck approach to develop a response to the emerging COVID pandemic. And for us as women's health providers, we had to figure out how we could stand up telehealth services in a less than 48 hour period. And if you know anything about obstetrics and gynecology, our world is the pelvis. And our work has traditionally relied on face-to-face, in-person examinations and conversations. So we were challenged with how do we continue to provide care for these women who were going to need care regardless of any social, physical distancing restrictions that were coming down the pike. And I am so pleased to say that we all got together over a weekend on using, um, it, you know, it seems so out of date, but we were using a conference call line and we got together to figure out how we could stand up technology so that we could meet our patients' needs on Monday morning at eight o'clock when those hundreds of patients were due to come into our clinic. So the way we were able to do that and to do that successfully, to deliver that care over the past 13 months is because we came together around a common goal. We were able to take care of one another because I I must remind everyone, we were dealing with frontline issues that we were facing um, perilous situations, you know, thinking about our own health, um, the health of our families, Everyone on my team, with the exception of one person, is a mother of young children. So we had to learn to take care of ourselves, have to take care of each other, and collaborate so we could bring our whole selves to the mission that was critical, and that is taking care of other women. Wow, thank you. Anyone want to go next? We have Portia, if you want to share a bit more about yourself and um, also to talk about maybe what does collaborative leadership look like in your world? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm I'm so thrilled to be on this panel after after hearing from our speakers and can't wait to hear from everyone else. Um, it's really exciting to be here and I, I am really looking forward to exploring what collaborative leadership and leading with our whole selves actually means in practice. Um, so just a bit about my background. I um, am from the New York area. I um, have family who's pr- pretty close to me at this point. I'm still on the East Coast. And um, I started out my career, I usually say generally, in the people and culture space. I, I did a little bit of HR stuff. I did a little bit of, of talent acquisition or recruiting. I, I did some work in diversity and inclusion. Um, all within the advertising industry. And at a certain point, I really connected with learning as this lifelong process. And I started to question why learning and development, employee growth and development wasn't more at the forefront of some of the the, uh, companies I was was working for. Um, So that led me to the practice of learning and development. Um, After leaving advertising, I ventured over to Spotify and moved into a a global role and a global team where we really started to explore what learning actually means in practice, all of the different sort of innovative ways that you can approach creating really interesting sticky learning experiences um, for for different kinds of learners. Um, And I really began to center around working um, working with the topics of leadership development in that role Um, and started to see just how growth and collaboration could actually take form, depending on sort of which team you're on, which part of the company you're in. So that brings me to to where I am now, which is uh, at Netflix. Um, Just a little bit about us, we're we're aiming to continue shaping the future of global entertainment because we believe that there's a better way to have people find and discover the content that they really love to watch. Um, The past year has been great uh, for, for Netflix, to put it generally. 
Um, but there is so much more that, that can be done um, for our business. Um, so here at Netflix, I'm in the learning and development space. And so what that means is I work on a team of other folks in L&D who have different special, specializations, but we mainly partner with our talent organization and leaders and product to design and develop learning experiences to meet the needs of our ever-growing, truly global at this point, workforce. And we integrate key aspects of our culture, um, uh, like context not control and freedom and responsibility, really key Netflix culture tenants, which means we typically lean away from defining learning uh, processes or experiences and more towards enabling leaders to create the right experience for their team. And so collaboration is actually woven throughout all of our core values at Netflix. And we are passionate learners, uh, but how we approach learning development and specifically collaboration has really changed pretty significantly over the past year. Um, so I wanna share just a bit, like, like many of you, uh, Netflix had leaders who were at the top of the year last year, previously clustered in these sort of geographic areas and previously had um, really put a premium on in-person connections as a way to foster collaboration. But now after sort of being globally distributed, um, we have a lot of folks who are collectively realizing that uh, proximity doesn't automatically correlate with collaboration. Collaboration is really a mindset that takes work to cultivate. Um, and there are so many challenges, obviously, that's, uh, that has already been shared, but so many challenges that came up over the last year um, that our leaders were really challenged to work through, one of which was how do we maintain collaboration in this space, right? How do we still kind of balance um, leaving room for our team members to discuss what, what's going on uh, in their personal lives, to really uh, have the space to talk about how what's going on in the world is affecting their work, but still sort of moving things forward and still enabling and fostering the kind of collaboration that moves our business forward. Um, and so as someone in the learning design and development space, I've been in the unique position of exploring spaces and conversations that seek to promote group collaboration. Um, and so what we've realized is, is, again, what I mentioned before is that collaboration goes well beyond working together. It's a mindset. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to kind of how that impacts women a, a little bit later, but I believe that um, from what I've seen, um, the, the leaders who are women in our country, uh, in our uh, company, excuse me, have really stepped up in this space and have really leaned into leading with, with parts of themselves that are totally authentic in order to facilitate collaboration for their teams. And um, so I'm really interested to, to, again, hear from others and to talk a little bit further about what that means, what that intersection has looked like, especially given the past year. Thank you. Thank you. And Leia, um, you could share a little bit more about your journey and maybe what collaborative leadership also looks like to you. Yes, thank you. Everyone, it's such an honor to be speaking with you all and hear your stories, Ingrid and Portia, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much. And for those of you who were not in the workshop, my name is Leah Bonvasudo. I'm a communication coach and founder of Present Voices, where I help people communicate with more confidence off the cuff through coaching and community. I was raised by a mime and a Broadway musician. So naturally I had a ton of social anxiety and I was gravitated towards theater very early on because there were a script, there were rules, there was a way to have permission to interact with other human beings, but it wasn't quite enough. And about 10 years ago, I started to do the work I do now in healthcare, particularly at a public hospital in Brooklyn, helping frontline staff de-escalate situations, advocate for themselves and their patients, and generally feel more heard. And that is my work today. Today, my work is living theater and I help individuals and teams use their own voices and tell their own stories so that they can bring their whole selves to work. I believe that collaborative leadership is true leadership. Collaborative leadership is not aggressive, oppressive or my way or the highway. And that kind of leadership is rooted in white supremacy. Collaborative leadership is inclusive, receptive, open, vulnerable, but it is also direct and clear and strong. Collaborative leadership means that workers feel heard and can bring their whole selves to work. 
And now I bring my whole self to work by make, leaving my bed a little messy sometimes or by letting you all know that my mother's in the hospital right now. And that makes it really hard to focus or just by being confident being where I am. But that is a privilege in itself. I run my own business. I am my own boss. I am white and that brings with it so much privilege. And so what we have to remember is how psychologically damaging it is to prevent people from bringing their whole selves to work. The most important thing I want us to remember in this moment is how much people are suffering and that the trauma is right now, it's happening right now and particularly for colleagues of color. Workplaces are not necessarily psychologically safe and for a lot of people, the workplaces have entered our homes. And so bringing our whole selves to work requires demanding that workplaces allow everyone to do the same. Thank you, that was so great. I'm gonna go off of presenting so that we can see each other a bit better. How do I close this? Okay. Great, thank you so much. As everyone could tell, we have people from, you know, the panelists have such different, fascinating um, backgrounds and have led in different teams across different industries. And I think, you know, kind of what Leia said, it's like collaborative leadership is true leadership. So definitely I'm gonna sit with that. So to kind of dive in onto the theme of courage to create, Ingrid, this question goes to you. Um, I know you recently launched a nonprofit to help women um, during the pandemic. If you could share a little bit more about what inspired you to do that and what work you're doing with that nonprofit. Do we still have Ingrid on? Technical difficulties, just one sec, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's definitely make sure she's back on, but I could also, we could continue. I wanna make sure she's part of the conversation. We'll hold space for a second. Thank you, everyone. Uh, are you, I'm back. I, do you see me? I just cannot even turn on my camera. So uh, let me try again. Sorry for that. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, we could hear you. Okay, super, Carolina. So I apologize for that. You know, technology. I love, I work in technology. So yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. when it works, it's beautiful. It's magnificent. When it doesn't work, it's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no so worries, let me I'm know when you are, when we start over and apologize. Yeah, no worries whatsoever. We're rolling through all these technical difficulties the best way we can. Not sure if you wanted to also be on video. I want, I'm trying, I ask, I'm requesting, can I be on video? You just maybe have to uh, <laughs> accept me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. If no, you, we can go with the Porsche and I will come back. I try to reconnect, no worries. Yes, no worries. Um, I guess going over, uh, Thank you. Know, hopping, no problem. Hopefully Navi and Eva can help you get squared away on the back end. But um, moving on to Dr. Williams, you have an incredible background as a health leader and especially during a pandemic. <laughs> Can you share a little bit more about what does work-life balance mean to you and um, maybe share some advice for some people who are also struggling to find work-life balance in whatever industry they're in? Sure, you know, this, um, I, I really appreciate this question because the subject of work life balance has been something that I have been working on uh, for many, many years. And it actually is the thing that brought me to my current leadership role. When I started at the University of Wisconsin, I actually just came on as a academic physician, primarily seeing patient care. But what we found was we had really high physician turnover and there was dissatisfaction and I was tapped to lead a task force to look at what, what was driving this turnover. And you know what I found was people were not actually able to bring their whole selves to work. Physicians were burned out. They were doing their academic work in the margins of their time. And you know, so the way in which we work, we might be up all night and then they were left 
to uh, to learn, to teach, um, to prepare presentations, maybe write papers on nights, on weekends. And that was burning people out and people were leaving. And so I set about trying to figure out how we could create a more inclusive environment so that people could engage in all of those things that led them to a career in academic medicine. Um, and we were able to successfully overhaul the way in which we worked. And that redesign actually facilitated us being able to pivot to a different um, way of working during COVID. So, you know, it's at the conclusion of doing that work as well, you know, this own personal quest of trying to find balance in my life that I've come to the conclusion there is no work-life balance. It is elusive. It is a Sisyphean task that will never be accomplished. You're just going to keep rolling the boulder up the hill and it's going to come back down. What we should really be striving for is work-life integration. How can you look at the things that you want to do professionally and integrate those things with what you want to do and you find meaningful personally? And for me, so Jan I'll take you back to January 2020. I wrote three statements on Post-it notes and I posted them on my bathroom, my bathroom. mirror. The first one, the first one said, said, my self-care self -care is non-negotiable. The second one said, my family time is non-negotiable. That second one is really important because by nature, my default is to work. I like to work. I feel uh, very fulfilled by the work that I do as a physician, as a leader. So I needed to be declarative and intentional that my family time was going to be non-negotiable. And the last statement said, I am not taking on new projects at this time. You can consult with me in October of 2020, and I will see if I have capacity to do that work in 2021. And I needed to be very intentional about seeing those statements and creating those that language that I could refer to, that could roll off of my lips, that I could rehearse on a daily basis in the interest of creating a better work life, an integrated work life. So even though 2020, you know, a couple months later, things turned out much differently than I had anticipated, those three statements did serve as a compass for me as the year went on. And certainly there was a lot to contend with. I mean, you know, talk about bringing your whole self to work. I had kids at home. My husband is also in healthcare. So at some point our house felt like a COVID command center. Um, so trying to take care of my team, trying to take care of my children. Um, and then, you know, when we were met with such racial unrest, like how do we do all of those things? How do we integrate? How do we find, um, dare I say it, how do we find balance? Um, I will tell you at the end of the year, my life was really good. I was able to connect with people because I did have those declarative statements. I was very clear about what, it, what the kind of work I wanted to be doing, what was important, and meaningful for me to do at home. And so when work came home, um, I was able to integrate. So I would, you know, my advice is be very intentional. If you want to find balance or if you want to have an integrated life, be very intentional about what it is you want to do at work. Be very intentional about what is meaningful for you at home and protect those things so that they fit together quite nicely. Thank you. I know a couple of us are laughing. We're not in our house. I know a couple of us are laughing. 
sorry, I think we're getting a bit of feedback. Um, but when you said, see you in 2021, <laughs> it definitely resonated with me. I know a couple of us are laughing about that. And so you also said something about, you know, redesigning the way we work and it helps, I can't help but to think of Portia, you know, you at Netflix, you, your specialty on learning and designing and you work with a lot of leaders um, to help foster this mindset of uh, collaborative leadership. If you could share a little bit more about how do you help people tap into that and um, and how and see how they could harness their power to leave lead more collaboratively while also leading with their whole selves? Yeah, and I'm I'm so glad that we're talking about just the relevancy of the last year because I don't think that we could have mm -hmm. this conversation and <laughs> mention that as well. So particularly in this last year, I've noticed that what I mentioned before, collaboration. Um, the, the actual definition of it goes well beyond just working together. Like I mentioned earlier, we have leaders internally who've, who've realized that proximity does not correlate with co collaboration. I think that is um, common belief sometimes in certain tech spaces and it's just, it's not true. Um, it's a mindset, not a set of tools and it's really rooted in trust and empathy, right? Trust in one another, your teammates, your peers, trust in the process of collaboration and trust in oneself. And so that of course involves establishing psychological safety like we talked about, but it also involves getting really clear with your own sense of self and knowing how you wanna show up as a leader. So I'll, I'll just speak from my own experience. Um, oftentimes I felt that in environments where I've, I've been a part um, um, of teams where women are more present in leadership positions, those environments tend to be more collaborative in general, but I've also seen how in environments where collaboration takes on this sort of one dimensional definition of just being close together and sort of just, just building consensus uh, because we're around one another, that can actually slow things down and ultimately diminish, uh, diminish the, the returns on what we're trying to create. Um, so, especially given the last year, I think that it's important to really define what collaboration means and what collaborative leadership looks like and practice for your organization, um, because it's going to look different everywhere, especially given what we've all been through this past year and are still going through. I need to change my language to be present day, okay? Um, so from a learning and development perspective, right? The question myself and my team are always coming back to is, how do, how do we help people practice that? How do we help people to define what this means and also define what collaborative behaviors look like in practice? And when I say collaborative leadership, I, I'm not just talking about folks who lead teams. Like you can lead as an individual contributor. Their leadership is not sort of just relegated to the folks who may have a manager or a director title. Um, leadership can come from so many different um, corners of the organization. So I just wanna say that. Uh, but we think about, again, what it takes to define what those behaviors look like in practice. Um, how do we support individuals, particularly women, in fostering the collaboration skills that translate across functions, across organizational boundaries? How do you uh, get to understand how you wanna show up as a collaborative leader and also as a collaborative teammate, right? Um, some of the, the big questions we've been tackling this last year is, especially for our leaders, is do you lead from a place of empathy and do you openly share knowledge to prevent knowledge uh, and information silos? Again, all rooted in best practices for collaboration, right? You want people to have access to the information that they need to grow and create and be innovative. Um, if we take a step back and, and look at some of the questions we've been grappling with, all of the, the qualities of, of collaboration, all the qualities of a collaborative leader takes bravery and authenticity. And those are things that make all, all the difference in collaboration, but they also take quite a bit of effort. Um, let's not ignore that as women, we're already so stretched in how we're expected to show up. Um, and so as, as we've explored this internally, we realized there's there's no like magic wand here. As, as women, especially, I think we have to be uh, really clear with our own sense of self so that we can lead collaboratively, whether you are leading a team or whether you are an individual uh, contributor. Um, we wanna be really clear about what our boundaries are. I like what Dr. Williams said about see you in 2021, right? I think 
at, at the end of the day, um, collaboration requires more than, than, like I said, that proximity piece, more than just um, um, the output. It, it requires a, a level of trust, authenticity, bravery, and also vulnerability to really be able to, to hear from one another and, and create great work. Um, and so again, I think, I think as, as women, if we can be clear with our own sense of self and be sure of how we wanna show up, how we wanna define collaborative leadership on our own terms, that will help to, to move us forward. Um, and hopefully protect our, our, our space, protect our, our own selves, our, our mental health in the process of being clear about those, those boundaries and really being sure of how we wanna show up. Thank you, Portia. Lighting us, you know, reminding us that it's sort of, it's leadership at all levels. Um, so Ingrid, good to have you back. <laughs> Uh, would love to, you know, hear the, oh, I'm getting some feedback. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. Anyone else hear that? I'm here. Can you hear me? Carolina, you are mute. Okay, am I, am I back? <laughs> You're back. Okay, I am getting some feedback. Am I the only one? Okay, <laughs> well, good to have you back, Ingrid. Um, you know, you were talking about how you've led by example at Google um, with collaborative leadership. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about your nonprofit and how you're also leading by example in that space by supporting other women and empowering women, especially during a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question. I, I really love the theme when you, you and I, we discuss and we brainstorm about, you know, have the courage to create, right? And um, as I mentioned to the to the audience earlier, I said, you know, I come from a very uh, a background where, you know, women ha didn't have a voice, didn't have a, uh, uh, the power. And, uh, and then now I had the opportunity to lead my career to work for a very large global organization. And, uh, and with the little of experience I have, I, and with the voice I have, I decided to create a change and to lead uh, and have the courage uh, to accept a mission, a very important mission last year during the pandemic uh, to become the president and chairwoman of a nonprofit organization uh, called a name uh, Positive Planet. So at the beginning, you know, I have the imposter syndrome, say, why me, why now? Uh, can I do that? Uh, that sure. And the president of the organization said, yes, we want you to be the voice. We want with your career, with your experience, we want you to inspire people. They come from nothing and they can change their life and, and, and have a really an impact in their own life, their family and definitely on the, on the community. So as all you know, last year was a uh, one of the saddest uh, year in, in decades. Uh, people were dying, people were suffering, people were isolated. And, uh, and America was just, uh, for me, I joined America 10 years ago, but it was just the, uh, all around me, people uh, very, uh, very, very impacted. So um, I decided to sign up, sign up for the challenge, even if I believe I, I couldn't do it, but I, I did it, I took uh, the role and responsibility and with a focus to build a better uh, and a more inclusive world around me. So really the goal of Positive Planet is to, uh, to look at underserved community around us and to help uh, women. And we started our first project, we helped the women uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We had an idea, amazing idea to help them to, uh, to go and, and, and achieve uh, from the impossible to possible. But it was just also uh, it, with my team, we started with one uh, volunteer in July during pandemic. Now with 65, create a board of director and focusing on meeting people where they are with ideas and many amazing potential and, uh, and, and really helping and, and support them. So uh, uh, Positive Planet is about, you know, volunteers, coaches, partnership with global large organizations like Capgemini or Gen Park. I have a one-on-one -on -one coaching. We build a digital platform. We are working in digital inclusion. The goal is we start with five women entrepreneurs in New York. The goal is to go to 15 Q2 and 100 by end of year, and maybe 2022 is it's possible uh, uh, helping and supporting 
thousands of uh, women entrepreneurs that want to really to uh, to change the game because we know in America women have been very impacted uh, these past years and uh, we wanted to support and and provide so uh, you know with uh, have the courage is then you know when you're more comfortable in your life and this was my case uh, at the stage of my career is to just lead by example when i say that is about expressing a voice not everyone will hear your voice but it's definitely to if you're passionate you want to give back to your community uh, is something you can do uh, and uh, even if i feel i couldn't i had people around me that gave me the strengths and the power to say, yes, I can. And I took that role and responsibility. And, you know, when I wake up in the morning, when I see the impact you can have around you uh, for this women entrepreneur, and we go even further. We are uh, working with um, Long Island Boot Fang and we are delivering food and uh, and things of first necessity for the people they have nothing in New York. So uh, we are uh, uh, really uh, trying to have an impact at a small level and hopefully uh, in the future, very, uh, very big impact. But if you wanted to participate to this uh, journey, uh, we are welcoming volunteer, you are welcoming donation just to uh, to like look next door uh, next year from you. It's these people that really need your help and need to uh, uh, to uh, to have uh, you as a human being, and, and if you want to volunteer to uh, to look at them and uh, and have an impact. So uh, it's just uh, very. Uh, I'm very appreciative for all of you to uh, again giving us time today. And there's so many ways of uh, giving back to our community. And this is my way last year to act and to impact. And it was to uh, really take that role. I believe I couldn't do it. Uh, but now uh, when I see the impact and the smile on the women's faces that we help them to uh, find and create their own job and help their family to survive and leave poverty is uh, something that I'm very passionate about. So very happy to uh, follow the conversation. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the theme of uh, today's event was very inspiring for me. And again, I'm appreciative of uh, you having me. Thank you for sharing that, Ingrid. Um, we'll be sharing, we'll drop the link in the chat for anyone else that wants to find out more about Positive Planet, wants to volunteer. It sounds incredible. Um, and so moving on to Leia, you know, as someone who also helps individuals, right, like find their inner power and strength, can you talk a bit, a bit, a bit more about that work? Like what type of um, leaders, you know, you know, how do, what types of people, <laughs> how, how do they find that in their leadership style? And how do you see yourself um, as a leader when no one else looks like you? That's a question that I ask myself all the time and would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. So today is the National Day of Action and Healing to Stop Asian Hate. And this is in response to the horrific violence against the AAPI community last week and ongoing, and it's been growing so much over the past year, 1900%. This also commemorates the anniversary, March 26, 1790, the Naturalization Act was signed into law prohibiting non-white people from becoming citizens of the United States. So I bring this up to say that we're socialized to see leaders a certain way. It's on purpose. And it's how white supremacy survives and thrives by holding on to power. And we've seen studies about this where they ask young girls to draw pictures of leaders and they draw confident looking straight white men in suits. Representative Ayanna Presley says the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. And so I believe that when it comes to us seeing ourselves as leaders, that the change will only come when, frankly, more Black, Brown, Indigenous women of color are leading, are actually in charge. So not professional development and not DEI, it just can't be enough, actually in charge. As a communication coach, I often hear from heads of HR or CEOs or supervisors with feedback for their teammates. And the feedback is almost always about wanting people to have more confidence. But often the feedback is not specific, it's not actionable, and it leads to very harmful ways of incorporating that feedback without having the ability to incorporate. And then when you tell someone they don't have confidence, it actually makes them have less confidence. But I loved how Portia brought up the word trust. Because confidence, the definition of it is to trust yourself and those around you. It's actually to trust boldly. And it's impossible to communicate confidently when you don't feel safe. It's just absolutely not possible. 
So this is why insecure leadership just doesn't work. And it's why we need such a big change. Confidence is not happening at work for most people because our workplaces have not supported most types of voices. And this is absolutely going to be strengthened by diversity, but it's not only along certain diversity lines, it's quite far reaching. So until the time comes when more types of leaders are actually leading, what can we do in the meantime to hear from more of us? First of all, as has been so well said, to give yourself permission to leave, even if you don't feel like a leader, even if you're an individual contributor, especially if you're a reluctant leader. I was never a natural leader. It did not come naturally, but I felt pulled by mission and by a power of bringing people together. And so give yourself permission. Also, like we talked about in the workshop, refuse to be rushed or interrupted. And spaces that are rushing you or interrupting you for you know whatever the intention behind it, it's not serving your voice. Our voices must be heard. And so practice taking up space and maintaining your power and committing to your own definition of presence, which is gonna be very different than an HR head's definition of executive presence. And finally, if you have the power, how can you create space and opportunities for others? How can you make other people feel validated and heard? And that is leadership and that can happen at all levels. Lastly, I personally have been devoted to supporting organizations that are leading this way and to also spending my money there. And so this is what we can all think about. If you're looking, if you're interviewing, where do you wanna work? Can you work with leaders who are, who are really enforcing this where there actually is diversity in leadership? Ella spoke so well about how to look for that. Such great tips. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ilya. It's really great tips um, on how to lead more confidently. And also the importance of elevating and supporting our BIPOC um, leaders to help them also feel comfortable in, in to feel included in this space because that is what collaborative leadership looks like. Uh, so to kind of close, I know we um, might have a few questions towards the end, but just thinking about your own individual like leadership styles and how that may have transformed during the pandemic. Is there something that you are excited to continue harnessing and growing um, in growing up in here? Yeah, for, for me, it was really something very important this year. It was about embracing the growth mindset. So it's, uh, it's all about don't be worried to become a different version of yourself and change for the better and just uh, adjust and adapt with the environment you're in, with the team you're in the people that surround it that also change and be okay with be a little bit outside of your comfort zone and definitely in order to connect differently to meet people where they are and to uh, collaborate in a way that is very innovative for you and your team or your family and the people around you so this is something i will leave with you <laughs> thank you yeah for me it is getting comfy with being vulnerable I have seen really moving uh, um, expressions of vulnerability from people in my personal life, my teammates, other, other folks at, at my company that have really, again, like just moved me and um, have really encouraged me to, to do the same. But I will share with you that historically, I have not felt comfortable or safe being vulnerable, especially at work, especially as a black woman. And I think the, the, the last year has just sort of shown us all that like, look, you're, you're, you're going to have to um, be okay with, with things not um, necessarily being as maybe buttoned up as you, you normally would have before we went through this pandemic or, or still going through. Uh, there, there have just been some expressions of, of vulnerability from others around me that have inspired me to tap into my own ability to be vulnerable and, and lead from that place. And I think I, I've been really surprised at what's pleasantly surprised at what's come out on the other side of, of me showing up in that way. And I'm hoping to continue to, to do more of that, to step into that, into that space. I will echo 
what both Portia and Ingrid um, shared. So having that growth mindset, um, while I thought I have always embraced a growth mindset, I will tell you this past year also taught me to be vulnerable and to show up authentically. I am a the product of the South. So I grew up in Alabama. I grew up um, very much aware that I'm an African-American person, a woman, but those labels took on new meaning and a new weight over the past year. And I will tell you, I had spent most of my time in leadership segmenting myself, keeping my womanhood and my blackness in a box because I didn't feel as though they were completely welcomed or appreciated in leadership. Well, here we are sitting in 2021, having learned many lessons last year. And my leadership, I think, is all the better because I am willing to use my voice as a woman to speak to my Blackness, to advocate for all those who had this shared commonality with me. And so that is what will remain post-pandemic, post all of the sort of distress that we had last year, is bringing my whole self, allowing my mind to embrace my whole self in leadership and sharing those vulnerabilities with those with whom I lead side by side and those who um, are following me to give them opportunities to bring their whole selves to work. I hope to bring forth warmth. I hope that warmth is brought forth for all of the wonderful people I work with. And I just want that for them because that is what we deserve is warmth in our workplaces and warmth in our lives. And we just need more of it right now to balance off the significant strength that has led the American economy for so long. Personally though, this past year has nearly broken me and we're still in it. It might still, this is hard and we're all really struggling, but the near breakingness of it has enforced the idea that I feel like I can do it anything. And I hope that when we come out on the other side of this awful time, I hope that we believe in ourselves. I hope that we do not take other people's nose as fact. And I hope that we can truly lead with our whole selves and what that means to each of us here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to hear you all speak about this. And it's really been an honor to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you back, Ingrid. Did you want to share something? <laughs> I don't know if I, you know, this was the most chaotic experience, but ladies, I see you smile, so make me smile, and it's all good. Okay, it's Friday night. It's just, uh, no, I'm, I'm hearing, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to hear all your, your feedback. I'm very inspired by each one of you, Porsche, Charlie, and, uh, and Makeba, about the, you know, your, your personal experience and the way where we, uh, as women wanted to like have a voice change and lead by example and I'm very uh, I'm very inspired by all of you and definitely uh, would love to have an opportunity to uh, to speak with the audience to take some questions because we we're, we're definitely here to serve you we all do these uh, uh, events just to make sure that you feel like you support it you're not alone we are all in with you, depending the industry we're in, depending on your goal in life, uh, uh, that uh, you know we, we, we are experiencing things, things that you are on a day-to-day -day basis at work in a personal life, uh, with uh, you know peaks up and downs and the roller coaster. So uh, you know this is, this is why I really love uh, you know this type of uh, opportunities is to make sure that we we all connect. And independently of uh, our culture, where we come from in the world, and uh, and uh, we, we we feel that uh, we, we can relate to each other. So uh, I'm very excited to see if you have any questions, and uh, looking forward to uh, to have a follow up conversation and and create a community. This is something I really am passionate about. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you so much. This is definitely inspiring to me. So we do have a couple of questions. I have a DM um, from someone that says, what are some red flags that can be gleaned during a job interview that the leadership of the company is not supportive and or collaborative? What kinds of questions can I ask during an interview to elicit that type of information about a company and its leadership? Great question. I, you know, I really, as a, a, a leader who is often interviewing in different spaces, whether there are for residency spots or for people who are joining our team as healthcare providers, or um, it, you know, it takes a whole network and a village of people to deliver healthcare. I think it's important for you to use your agency just as much as those individuals are interviewing you for a role, you are interviewing that organization to make sure that it is a good fit. So asking um, very respectful but direct questions about how, what is their approach to collaboration? What is their approach to inclusivity? And giving people opportunities to use their own respective voices. So I think if a leader is shying away from answering those questions, those very direct pointed questions, that is the red flag that perhaps that is not the organization to which you want to align your talents and your efforts. Yeah, I mean, Magira, it's just, I love your answer. I think it's super important to be honest, direct, and you wanted to join an organization that looks like you like you can relate to and feel like included where you can have a voice. And, you know, when I create Positive Planet for me and I create the board of director was super important to say, I want to create diversity, equity and inclusion. And so it starts with me as a responsibility. And my board of director today is 50% women, 50% men. And, you know, you have to, I, again, I keep saying that, but you have to lead by example. Google, same thing. When I joined Google, I was head of diversity, equity and inclusion. And when I was going to Loop, and when I'm going to interview for a job, and when I say like I have 10 resumes for the same people looking the same way, I say no. Till I don't have a diverse panel, a diverse team thing that you're offering me from representative of our country, of our world, I'm not going to go for an interview loop. So as a leader, as a manager, as a hiring manager, you have that responsibility to say no, I'm waiting till I don't have a representation that looks like the way I want my organization to look like. So you applying for a role, it's amazing. And I, I really encourage you to have a voice and say, OK, uh, is your uh, organization diverse? So how many uh, amazing people coming from all diverse uh, country, uh, gender, etc., cetera, are, are part of the team? Because I wanted to be part of something big and grow. So yeah, encouraging you to, uh, to say that. And I think there's many organizations today that are very sensitive about they don't know how to do it but that at least they have the intention to do it which is good and then it's on you to help them to uh, to also create that new culture new environment that foster um, a, 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 you know a, a place for everyone to feel comfortable and uh, feel happy about being part of the journey so uh, i love your question thank you that was really great thank you i'm sure if anyone else wanted to um answer that or I could jump to another question and also another great question how do you deal with unconscious bias on the job <laughs> we all have experience I, with that I, oh yes I, I well, yeah. on that. right um I think that anytime you are encountering anything that looks like feels like is unconscious bias never doubt what your gut instinct is telling you. I think oftentimes we are conditioned to doubt um, our own instincts around things like that, especially because unconscious bias can show up so many different ways. It can show up as overt bias. It can show up as, as just microaggressions or not just micro, but it can show up uh, in, in little little or, or, or very large scale ways. So the first thing is never ever doubt what your gut instinct is telling you about what you're experiencing. Don't let anyone else sway you from that either. The other thing that I found to be helpful is to find your community, find your people that are, are the ones that outside of your team, they, they may be out, outside of your, your department, 
but the, the people that you know you can tap to just openly connect with and talk to and share uh, your true authentic experience, share with them what you've seen and what you felt and, and find the people who you know will support you in, in that process of sharing. Um, I have found that that through through different pockets of community, some, you know, I've worked at organizations where there are no employee resource groups, right? So I have to like create my own, right? There are some places I've worked where I have to create my own like cabinet to consult with my, my trusted people and partners that I've identified as the ones that I will go to and lean on to um, connect with because you need to have an outlet and a way to, to talk about what's what's happening to you and what you're experiencing. And this is me speaking very broadly, very generally, not knowing what, what other mechanisms you may have in your workplace to help you actually work through those. I encourage you to, to lean on those um, mechanisms if, if they are in place. But those are two things that I just really wanted to bring forward about unconscious bias because it can show up in so many different ways. And I think our, for our first instinct um, after sort of, you know, uh, realizing that something may be off is to doubt ourselves and that doesn't serve us well. So that and really finding the people to connect with who can help you navigate and help you through, mm -hmm. I think that's really, really powerful when it comes to um, handling unconscious bias. And I, 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 I love your, your feedback, Rosha, but I think it's a, it's a responsibility and it's a day-to-day -day responsibility. It's not because you're a white woman and blah, 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 that you don't have an unconscious bias. But I just wanted to, we all have, and it's very surprising because this is what I love about the organization I'm working on, where that we have constant training every year, every six months to remind us. It's not because you are from, coming from an, a, a, a diverse background that you don't have unconscious bias also, right? So we wanted to create that inclusive world and all of us we have, and it's about being mindful about the vocabulary you use, the comments you do about gender, about people where they're coming from, and if, independently of your natural, your culture, etc., cetera, we, we all can be hurtful. So it's just about always being mindful and, Empathy, I, I know you mentioned a lot of that word today is, is all about that. Is also develop empathy with you because you cannot be perfect. And sometimes you, you feel like you, you're super inclusive, you're super diverse, and you say something's not right. And it's okay. But if you have an open dialogue with your peers that they are different and they're coming from different environment, this is really when you start creating a culture when everyone feels that they can have a voice. Uh, but it's definitely is always touch point with people that are not like you. They don't think like you, they don't come from the same background, and then ask questions, like genuine questions and caring questions, where you can learn about yourself and others. And I think this, uh, I will always encourage every one of us to like rethink and reflect, but it's a, it's a daily uh, exercise. It's not one time, oh, I did a training on diversity and inclusion and unconscious bias, I'm, I'm good with it. No, <laughs> because we are, you know, so many different nationality and people are so diverse on, in this world. So we, it's something we need to, every time when I feel like a responsible, uh, something is important. Thank you. I would also say, I think it is important to give yourself a bit of grace to not have to be the person who's calling it out all the time. Because as a recipient of the unconscious bias, your feelings can get hurt. And that is a weight to be carried. And the challenge for all of us that are around is to develop allyship so that you can, as a sort of victim or a recipient of an unconscious bias, those individuals have a community to come to and we allies can then step up and advocate on their behalf and not putting them in double jeopardy to feel and be the recipient of that bias and have to call it out and act upon it. So it is okay to take a step back too and not have to confront it head on. Thank you. So that's all the time we have for questions. Um, to the audience, to everyone here, our community, feel free to continue engaging with us and asking any questions or sharing any thoughts by tagging Courage to Create or, and Women Tech Makers. Um, and now it's raffle time. So we're closing out the event and let's we'll all come back together. I know we have a couple of other presenters that are gonna share a bit more about the raffle. Um, but if you could, of course, give, let's give a virtual, <laughs> round of applause our amazing speakers our amazing leaders thank you so much for 
for leading the way you lead and um, for bringing your energy and your presence to this today, despite the technical difficulty difficulties. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm going to share now my presentation. Um, but it's basically just a link reminder for the raffle. So be sure to fill that out if you wanna be included in our raffle. And I, I think we are closing the form any second now. Oops. Let's see. Great. Did some, did Linda and Eva, anyone wanted to hop on here and share, share a bit more about the raffle? Yes, we closed the form raffle. We already have like 160 uh, answers for the raffle. Amazing. So 165, <laughs> so we are good there. <laughs> and uh, I think we have an announcement. Uh, Anna, are you ready for the announcement? Oh, yes. Yes, we do. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Oh, okay. Hope's oh, Anna, and are you? Hi, uh, as you just met Ingrid and she talked about the positive planet, you have the chance to work with her. She has an amazing team, whatever your skills are, marketing, a product management, pro program management, web development. Uh, you can contact her directly at Gonzalez Ingrid at google.com. That's for to donate your time. It's also tax time for uh, deduction in your taxes. You can also <laughs> donate your money. Thank you. <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's see. Do we have any other announcements? Of course, our sponsors. And we are ready. Ah. Yes, we have our sponsors now. So for uh, uh, for everybody who fill out the form will be included in our raffle. For uh, beginning, we will uh, all the attendees will get from Atria Institute of Technology uh, uh, Coursera free lifetime uh, license uh, for all of you. I will uh, post the link in chat and we will send the uh, email follow up with all the links. So don't worry if you miss it, you will receive it anyways. Also, O'Reilly will offer 30 days full access to the library to all of you. I will post quickly that in chat also. Uh, Practicum by Index is offering six fuller, uh, full scholarships to their boot camps to choose from two data analysts, two data scientists and two uh, web developer. Uh, they will uh, uh, choose uh, uh, based on your answers to that form and tomorrow we'll announce in a follow up email who is the winner and you will be contacted by them also on Monday. Um, and uh, uh, we have uh, five O'Reilly uh, books at our uh, uh, wheel of names and ROI training uh, for on-demand Google Cloud certifications trainings for associate and professional cloud engineering. And I will uh, hand it over to uh, Elizabeth and Anna for the next sponsors, please. Oh, sure. Well, Wellframe is um, sponsoring with four uh, $50 gift certificates to amazon.com. And I will put you in touch with, uh, with my contact, Rich. Uh, they're hiring and they are at Seaport. They're 100% virtual now, um, but they are in a very nice uh, commercial area of Boston. Uh, they are doing um, digital health. Uh, Ava, did you wanna share? Yes, of course. So Gaspacho is offering a $50 Amazon gift card. We have a pretty cool lineup of raffles. And finally, thank you to Google for the second generation Google Nest Hubs, which was just released. So we'll have three lucky winners shortly. Amazing. 
So can I share my screen for the raffle? Can you show the next slide for just a second for the prizes and we go to, oh, these are our uh, organizers and these are the prizes for all of you. And I will share my screen so we can uh, extract the winners. One second. Uh, yes. Very exciting. Thank you, everyone, for joining us up until this point. <laughs> Thank you. This is exciting. I so think exciting. everybody can see the wheel, right? I will uh, paste the names <laughs> from the... Spin the wheel. <laughs> so we have quite of names. So what are we going to extract first? So we can keep... Uh, are we going to extract first the Google uh, Nest Hubs? Anna? Let's start with google yes yeah because we have restrictions on uh, shipping in case you win one of those i think we will switch to a gift card uh, or what yes if know. you unfortunately if you're not in the us or canada or india we have to give you a gift card instead 50 dollars gift, gift card and we will uh, raffle again the next hub okay i will go for the first one Um, we don't see anything. You don't see my screen? No, we don't. Um, oh. We see the empty wheel of names. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. I will close it and I will start all over. So it doesn't count. Stop sharing <laughs> one second. So please let me know. Okay. Now, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Pretty. Okay. <laughs> we will start all over. I didn't eliminate nobody. So the first Google mini hub, Nest hub, sorry. Augustin F. <laughs> okay, so give us a sec, just to, yeah, to take the names. Okay, winner, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, next. Next, Google Mini. It's him in United States or something. Can you check even that uh, answer, Eva? Yes. Okay, so wait. Watch the chat for a DM, DM if you're a winner, please. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Next, next winner for a Google Nest Hub. Jessica. All right, Jessica Chavez. Congratulations. Okay, remove. It's her in our shipping area. Can you check? Yes. Okay, we are good. Let me make sure again because my screen just moved. Sorry, technical difficulties. Yes, yes, we're safe. Okay, okay. next. So normally you we can do pronounce like... this name. Getu Agrawal. I don't know. I'm sorry. We apologize for butchering your name. Gitu or Gitu. I'm so sorry for the mispronunciation. Google Nest Hub, congratulations. Uh, Is... We have to check location, correct? Yeah. Right? Can you check location? And US, awesome. Okay, congratulations. Okay. Great. Okay. What we go to uh, raffle next? So we have five O'Reilly books. Should we do O'Reilly books? Do those? Okay. 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 First, first winner. Look, Smith. Luke Schmidt. Okay, let's find Luke. And that doesn't have any uh, US. No, we account. don't need shipping. We don't need shipping, so we should be good. Alrighty, so let me write this in the chat. 
Okay, next. And next winner, please. Congratulations. Always O'Reilly book. Or digital book. So there's another O'Reilly, correct? Yeah. Karimu Mohamed. Congratulations. Okay, I'm gonna write that in the chat. Second. Third book, O'Reilly book. Yeah. <laughs> Mohammed Malkani. Okay, let's see. Let's find you. This Wait, is the third, right? Now the fourth book. O'Reilly. O'Reilly oh. book. So number four, book number four. Let's go. This is a very silent drum roll. Wilhelmina Tete. Okay, so Wilhelmina, I can spell sometimes. I put it in Slack. I pasted okay. it in Slack for you. We're good. Next, the uh, last uh, O'Reilly book. All right, so let's raffle it off. Number five, right? Yeah. Milena. Drum roll, drum roll. Milena Pereira Machado. Okay, winner, O'Reilly. Congratulations, all of our winners. Mm -hmm going yeah. into the chat we need some cheerleaders here <laughs> yeah we do <laughs> what we are raffling for i i pull accidentally i already the, the roi roi training let's do the roi training antonella cologne yay <laughs> what did we just raffle roi training okay let's take it a little slower because i'm not as fast as you yeah <laughs> I accidentally you know? pushed it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank you. So, are you wanna... the first one? Are we good? How many ROIs do we have? Four. Four. Second. Nice. Okay. Let's do this. <laughs> Number two. Another ROI training. Okay, let's find you. Where are you? I believe it's Ba. Okay. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. If back put it in the chat. Deep. Okay. This was the second. So we go for the third ROI training uh, course. Yes, so let's raffle off number three. Oh, I did pronounce it correct. Direct message. Thank you. Congratulations. I'm glad I didn't butcher your name. <laughs> okay. So. Rashab. Congratulations, Rashab, Rashab Go. Awesome. Well. Okay. So we have another winner. Yeah. Last one. Last ROI training, right? Yeah. Right. We are going for the last one. I don't know. I'm not going to claim to be able to count. Just give me a second, though, so I can. Fourth one. It's spinning. Okay. One, two, three. This is the fourth one. Let's do this. Yeah. Andrea N. Okay. Andrea N. And you won. Okay. Congratulations, Congratulations. to the ROI winners. Good job. Next. What do we have next for uh, the raffle? The right. well frame, the well frame uh, Amazon gift cards. Right, right. There's five gift cards all the same from yeah. Gazpacho and Wellframe. Yes. Okay. Let's, do that. So let's go for the first Amazon gift card from Wellframe. Who's our lucky winner? Yannick. Yes, Tic Santien. I don't know. I think it's French name or something. 
Yannick, congratulations. Sorry for our horrible pronunciation. We don't mean <laughs> to butcher your name. We apologize. Congratulations. Second well frame gift card. Wait, didn't Amazon they didn't gift card. Tell us that to apologize? Didn't they tell us to? <laughs> I can't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Aaron Madero. Aaron, okay. Congratulations. Wait, Aaron, weren't you in the room with me? My Android friend, Aaron? Aaron. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, next. Third uh, well frame Amazon uh, gift card. Yes, let's go for it. I want to see who is brave on this name. <laughs> Chandra, I probably butchered it, but I'm trying. If I say it clearly enough that you can understand if it's to you, Racha, Kula, Mahesh, Sarat, Chandra, I have quite a long name. I only use two parts of my name, if you need to know. So, okay. so now we have the last well-frame Amazon gift card, right? Let's go for it. Let's do this. Is it spinning? I can't tell. Yay. Rakmawati. Awesome. Rakmawati. Congratulations. Can you hear all the noises, the background noises? Ooh. Can you hear <laughs> Now I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's working. Now we are going for the Gaspacho Amazon gift card, right? Yes. Okay, let's do that. Can Candice. Yeah. Candice. Congratulations. Yeah. Nice, nice. Congratulations, Candice. All right, so you should see it posted in a sec in the chat also. Are we done with all the prizes? I think we are done. So, right? Um, Can someone see. check before I unshare my screen? And I yeah. head it over to Carolina or who is. We did our ROI. Yeah. Okay. We did the five Amazon gift cards. We yes. did the three Nest Hubs. We did the five O'Reilly books. Right? I think we are good. Yeah, I think we are good. Okay. Perfect. I will right. stop so sharing my screen now and I will head it over to you. Yeah. By the way, Linda, I got a question that um, Coursera offers free uh, course per year anyway. So is that in addition to? Yeah, I put the, uh, all the links in chat. I will post it again. Okay. The, there should be in chat and I will post it again. It's for everybody. So uh, you will have to put in the affiliation field, right? The GDGCR. So uh, they know that you are coming for, from this event. So you will find all the links from O'Reilly, from Practicum, from Atria Institute. You will find all the links in chat. So please take advantage. We will share all these links in a follow-up email uh, tomorrow when we will have even the winners for practicum. They will pick up the winners for the boot camps. So p please fill out the form at your best knowledge. So to, to be picked, <laughs> to be chosen for. So I, I head it over to who is next, Carolina or who? Thank you. That was amazing. Like I said, what is a GDG event, a GDG mega uh, workshop summit like this without amazing prizes? Thank you so much again to all our sponsors. Um, and I think that sort of wraps up, you know, this evening's event. We, we learned so much. I know I have. Um, and I'm excited to just continue, you know, seeing what you all have learned too. So feel free to share, you know, what gems you've walked away with, interact with us on social media, tag us, courage to create and women tech makers. 
Thank you so much to everyone for being here. And of course, to our amazing organizers. It is a powerhouse team right here. It really took a lot of effort and um, I, you know, I love working with you all. So this has been such a fun, fun opportunity. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone for being here. I'm not sure if anyone else has anything else to add, but. I had a question that somebody asked me. Yes, it's one course per year, not a certification. Last year was a, a full certification in Coursera, but they might change the agreement depending on Coursera. So uh, it's, it's good to have it. So uh, it's one course for a year for the moment. Last year was a full certification. Thank you for the question. Perfect. And so we'll also follow up via email, right? Just confirming um, the winners of the raffles. Then we'll also be sharing other links as well, like the link to volunteer um, to Positive Planet and um, a recap recording of the sessions this evening as well. So stay tuned there and ask us any questions in, through email. Really excited to to see you all. I see Linda's dog in the background is ready for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, thank you to our speakers, our panelists, thank and you. thank you, Carolina. Thank you for leading the effort. Yeah, thank you, thank so you everybody. And thank you all our GDG leads. Can we share that slide for all, to thank all our GDG leads? All different GDG organizations. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's Just a great effort and uh, great yeah. speaker. <laughs> Amazing. Together we yeah. rise and better together has never been truer. And we are looking forward to have all our attendees to our next events. All of us have planned in the future. There is, a, I think, a uh, Flatterista conference that is coming up on, uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you to all our organizers for putting up this uh, wonderful event. Thank you, Thank you. you can spotlight them. Uh, you can spotlight also and just wave, come in, say hi, yeah. say bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, I see you're in there. Navi, you. David, Doug. David, Doug, Roman, Carol, so much, everyone. everyone. <laughs> I see a bunch Julia. of people. <laughs> Julia, <laughs> Navi. Yeah, thank you, everyone. David Silva, Irenia, <laughs> the list goes on and on. There was a huge team effort here. Uh, and and all let's thank all our attendees, all our uh, attendees. Thank you. All the speakers should join us again. They were absolutely fabulous. <laughs> exactly. So have a great evening. Have a great weekend. Thank you all. We hope Thank you had you. a good time and keep an eye on the meetups. We'll be posting events again soon. Yes, uh, stay yes. safe. Well, Thank you. See you soon. Warm weather is coming soon. soon. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.